uh, Bernard okay uh, let me do yeah. because I thought Bernard you could do just uh, ask the students to tell us some of those problematic areas uh, so that they are captured here uh, where they really think they need uh, additional assistance so you can take charge as you wait for Mr. Lasso right certainly prof okay okay uh good morning friends uh, again sorry for the miscoordination this morning but uh, we have issues usually in, around the research that we can still repeat or extend or or add on from other seniors who have possibly have not been on the platform uh, ever since we started. So kindly please uh, students, if there are those items or issues that uh, you think we could extend a discussion on this morning, as we wait for something, uh, you feel free to raise your hand up or or type in the chat, and then we can we can pick up on that as we move on. James, Mubangizi. Yes, 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 Bernard, how are you? Good, good, good. Okay, you are just sharing something. Hello, everyone, my name is Kirk. Uh, uh, Bernard. Yes, Joseph. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we we apologize for the hiccups this morning. Um, it's not usually the way we work, but looks like uh, there was a miscoordination somewhere. But uh, we are really very sorry, and uh, we hope that things should be much better. So this morning, um, as uh, Professor has already indicated, that there are some issues uh, that uh, we struggle with. And I think one of them could be that we we still find it difficult to, you know, to write the statement of the problem that is eye-catching, uh, that people can read and really see that you have a problem that needs to be investigated. So this morning I I have a short video here of about thirty minutes. We could even make it uh, shorter that could help us uh, highlight some of those key things that you might need to pay attention to uh, when you are writing your statement of the problem. Please allow me share this with us briefly and thereafter we will be able to, to, to share together what you think uh, needs to be added or what you think you have been able to learn and understand from here. We will then uh, continue uh, into our discussion after this. Uh, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Kirk Kirstein. I am the provost here at City University of Seattle. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about a key part of your applied dissertation, and that is problem statement. You're going to hear a lot in the coming weeks, days, months about your problem statement. And your problem statement is something that is the cornerstone of your dissertation. So it's really, really important that you work with your chair and you work with your faculty to come up with a good problem statement. The problem statement is really a statement of a problem in your field that is a documented problem, verified, supported by the literature, that is having an adverse or negative impact on some element of your field. Your goal in your research is to look at that problem and potentially come up with a resolution or some kind of intervention that will either solve that problem or will minimize that problem and provide benefit to those in your field. 
So that's kind of in a nutshell what the problem statement is all about. But we're going to go into a lot more detail about the problem statement in this presentation. And I'm going to share with you a couple of tricks that can be useful in determining what a good problem statement would be and a couple of things to watch out for. The first thing I want to talk about is the type of research that we do at CDU in both the Doctor of Education and the Doctor of Business Administration program. We employ the type of research that's called applied research. And applied research can be set apart from basic research and the comparison is very, they're very similar. It's just the applied model takes things one step further. Let's talk first about basic research. Basic research is basically founded on a question. A researcher will come up with a question such as, what is the relationship between the number of hours of sleep and academic achievement? Um, or what is uh, what are the qualities of a certain group of people who might be undergoing a certain phenomenon, that kind of thing. So they come up with a question and they conduct research to provide insight or reveal information about their question, to try to answer their question. And when they do that, they they're very likely generating new knowledge and they're very likely advancing the field um, by contributing that knowledge to that field. What they're not doing though, is they're not applying the information or knowledge that they created in their dissertation to a specific problem. And that's where our model is a little different. In the CDU model, you will do the same thing. You will generate new knowledge, and you will generate knowledge to advance your field, but you will also apply that to the resolution or solution of a particular problem that you've identified, which is why it's really key that you identify a good problem statement because by doing so, you have got something that you can be passionate about, something you're going to spend a lot of time with, and something that you can actually benefit a lot of people in the field if you're able to come up with a good solution and provide that to others that are working in that field. Let's talk now about the problem statement itself. Um, it has many aspects, and I'll tell you what a problem statement isn't. A problem statement isn't your opinion of a particular problem in a particular field. The problem statement is much more involved than that. The problem statement has several different aspects. First of all, it represents a clear problem in your field, something that, that you're, you're absolutely certain is a problem in the field. Um, it is, but it is not based on your opinion. So when you come up with a problem in your field, you have to be able to cite literature that supports that this is in fact a real problem in the field. It is not a problem that you think exists. It's got to be something that has been documented. It should be having a negative impact on some area in your field and its resolution will be of value to some area of your field. Let me give you an example. A problem in the field of business would be that the number of small businesses that fail within the first five years is approximately 50 to 60%. That is not my opinion. That is actually a fact. I can find documentation to support that. It is having a negative impact on some area of my field, specifically those 50 to 60% of those businesses or whatever ones that didn't want to fail. And it's resolution, if we can resolve that problem, come up with areas to actually make that business failure rate lower, it will have a, a, a serious value to the people that, um, who are certainly are currently undergoing uh, business failures. The other thing about a problem statement, I want to be really clear about this, it should be very clear, um, very clear what the problem is, and it should be very succinct. And that will probably make better sense when we look at the examples, because a problem statement isn't just, you know, the problem is, there has to be some sort of explanation. Even with my example where the problem is business failure rate, I still would have to come up with, well, who says, you know, what's my citation, what's my source? I would have to come up with other information. Why do people care about that problem? And why would its resolution be of value? So it can get a little low and it can get a little long. Um, so the best, uh, the, the more succinct you can make your problem statement, the better, because then that becomes uh, very clear. Your problem statement should also be limited in scope. The number one problem that I see from students who are proposing a problem statement is they're they make it way too broad. You're not going to be able to research enough. You're not going to have enough people in your sample. You're not going to have enough businesses that you look at or enough schools that you look at to define or solve a problem for the entire world, the entire population. So you're going to want to limit that scope. Um, I live in the Northwest, so I would probably, if I was looking at small business failures, I would probably look at small business failures in the city of Seattle. That limits my scope. I'm not looking at the whole world now, I'm just looking at Seattle. Later, when my research is done and finished and wrapped up and I've come up with some results, I can try to apply those results to other communities. Uh, but right now, for now, I'm going to look at Seattle. I'm also maybe limit business failures. That's pretty broad still. So what about business failures of say family restaurants or other small businesses or some segment of the marketplace 
where I can really focus in on and still discover information about business failure that can be applied to different sectors in different locations around the community. So you can see how you can take a, a problem that can be very broad in scope and you can start narrowing it down, narrowing it down geographically, narrowing it down demographically, narrowing it down by uh, just like in my example, business type or school type, um, age population of students, those kinds of things, to get it down to something that is manageable. You really want to get it to something that you can actually manage and research. And, and again, at the end, when you've finished and all done, you can then go and apply your results to a larger or different population to the extent that those larger or different populations are similar to the one you used to generate your results. While I will advocate to every doctoral student that it's important to limit the scope of your problem statement, don't limit it too much. I have seen people go way too far. And what they do is they limit it um, and then their sample size becomes something that really isn't representative of the larger population. And it becomes something that is really only relevant to the sample. Um, and a good example is like I've seen studies where uh, an individual wanted to do a uh, sorry, quantitative study and they were to talk to employees from three companies. That's just not enough in a quantitative study. Or in a qualitative study, uh, a researcher was going to look at five students at one school. Again, just not enough. There's not enough um, in data that's going to come from that sample. So while it's important to limit the scope, don't limit it too much. A little bit more about your problem statement. It is unique. Remember, this is unique research. This is something that you need to do um, and you want to do, but it's also something that nobody else has done before. And that can be a bit of a challenge um, because sometimes you're going to have to do quite a bit of searching just to make sure that what you're doing is in fact unique. I'll tell you what not unique. Um, it is not unique to take your study, discover that somebody else has done something very much like it before in a different state and say, oh, I'm going to do it in Washington state. That makes it unique. No. Um, what makes it unique is that it's being applied in a different way or that the study is actually asking different research questions or it's looking at things that nobody really has ever looked at before. So make sure your study is unique in doing something that is just yours. Um, your problem, again, needs to be substantiated in the literature. So when you state your problem statement, I will expect that your chair is going to be looking for citations directly from the literature that shows that this is in fact a problem. And you may have to spend time in your problem statement explaining a little bit about the problem, why it's impactful, and why it matters. Your problem is described to a level of detail that makes it meaningful. Again, that's getting back to that point of being able to describe kind of the, uh, the, the information about the problem um, that shows that it is having a negative impact on uh, some measure of your field. It, again, cannot be your opinion or anything that appears to be your opinion. I've seen so many problem statements where there was no citation for literature and you know, had arguments with students that said, I know this is a problem, I see it every day. Well, it's not good enough. It's not good enough that you see it every day um, because your perspective is not based, it's not founded in, in research. What you want to find is you want to find somebody who's actually researched it and said, you know, we have a problem here, or it's clear that there's a problem, or it's clear that, you know, the future we're going to need to resolve this, whatever. Um, and also, uh, you want to make sure that your problem rises to the level of being dissertation worthy. And I'm going to give you two qualities that would make something dissertation worthy. Um, one, that it furthers your field, that it advances your field, um, and two, that it creates new knowledge. And those two really go hand in hand. Here's what is it creating new knowledge. If you decide that you're going to analyze some data that maybe is sitting in a file cabinet and want to just drive somewhere, and you're going to draw new conclusions by analyzing that data, you've not really created any new knowledge. Um, even though you did some analysis of the data, you might have found some interesting stuff. That's not really creating new knowledge. You didn't go out do research, create, uh, gather the results, and then draw conclusions based on your research. You just looked at somebody else's work. So that is not dissertation worthy. Uh, what also would not be dissertation worthy is to come up with a problem statement that nobody really cares about. It's so highly specific or highly you know, uh, targeted that uh, the resolution of it isn't really, you know, nobody's really going to care. And so I would say that that's not dissertation worthy either. Um, again, Make sure that your work is going to generate knowledge and that it's going to advance your field. But first and foremost, make sure that your research is going to be something that actually addresses your problem. A clear problem statement is important. Yeah, it is important. It is the foundation of your study. Um, it needs to be significant as evidence in the literature. It needs to be important to you. You'll spend at least a year if you're a very, very fast student 
probably one of two or three years with this problem statement. So make sure it's something that's very specific um, and or very uh, significant to you. And I will tell you this from experience, both as a doctoral student and as a doctoral chair, you are likely to change your mind 10 times. You are likely to come up with 10 different problem statements and then think, ah, oh, that's great. I finally found a problem statement that I want to work with. And then over the course of the next couple of days, you'll start to see faults with it. Fine. That is a process that you will go through and everybody will have a different process, but most of you will probably change your mind. I would guess five to 10 times if I problem statement. Once you do land on a problem statement, you will evolve your problem statement. Problem statement, the very first problem, the time you come up with your problem, what you will actually work with, it will not be in good format. That's just, that's just the reality of it. But it will get in better format as you go through it and you revise it, you add more information, you find more literature. You get to a point where you feel very, very comfortable that this is the problem that I want to research. And I know it's a problem it's supported in the literature. I believe that the, the solution of this problem will advance the field and create the knowledge. Um, it, it, it happens over time. And your chair is going to work with you. It's your job in your chair to work with you until you get the problem statement right. And I would tell you to focus on getting that as close to right as you can. This doesn't mean you can't resolve or revise it, but get it as close to right as you can before you start working on the other aspects of your dissertation. Because if you start looking at purpose statements or research questions, or you start thinking about methodology or even literature, and you don't quite have your problem, your problem statement right, and you're going to change your problem statement, everything else has to change as well. So get the problem statement right before you uh, move on. All right, two parts of the problem statement. There's the general problem, and then there's the specific problem. Now, the general problem is basically a general statement of a problem. And in my earlier example of business failure, I can state a general problem as being the percentage of business failure rates for small businesses that would be maybe under 50 employees, uh, 50 employees is too high. That's a general problem. It's too high. It's, uh, and, and I don't really have to provide a lot of um, detail on that one. Uh, it's the specific problem where I provide all that detail and I do that limiting of scope and a suggestion of the literature, although I can provide literature to support my general problem statement as well. Uh, but the general problem statement is really kind of an introduction and it also helps set the stage of the significance of your problem, right? If I can say that the general problem is that the business failure rate is far too high across the country and I can cite the literature to show that and I can provide some key facts about that and what the impact of that is, when I get to defining my specific problem, which is limited in scope, it is very specific, it's very succinct and very direct, I will have sort of the foundation of the general problem to make that specific problem more understandable. So those two things really go hand in hand. And you'll state a general problem, which can be a general sort of statement of a problem. It would not be something you would research because it would be far too broad, um, but it sets the stage and creates the context for the specific problem. So general problem is business failure rate in the country is 60% um, in the first five years. My specific problem of small family owned restaurants in the Seattle marketplace have a failure rate of whatever percentage that is. Um, and it makes it far more easy to understand. So general problem statement, as I've said, is a larger problem in the field. So your job here is to describe the general problem to address through the study that's based on the defined needs or gaps from the literature. What is it that we don't know, right? If we know that business failure rate is 60% across the country, why is that happening? And that's something that we really don't know. And that also introduces why you are going to do your specific study of small family-owned restaurants in the Seattle market, because we know that we don't know what the causes of all those failures are. Um, and then validation, what literature can you cite to indicate that this is a real problem? Where the real work comes is in the specific or localized problem. So how is the larger problem of business failure rate affecting a specific organization, a specific group of organizations, a specific demographic or a specific population? And that's what you're going to study with, with uh, your research. So your problem statement is what is your specific problem? Uh, again, we need to know how do you know what's a problem, what literature can you cite? You want to know the scope. Um, how are you limiting the general problem down to a specific scope somewhere or for whom you be researching this problem? can't the whole world. So what are your delimitations? Those are the choices you're making about limiting your scope that you plan to place on the scope of your problem. Who is your audience? Who is affected by this problem? Um, who's adversely affected if it's not solved? Or who will be benefiting, benefiting from the resolution that your research might be able to find? And then keeping in mind, depending on the program that you're in, you're either in a business administration field or you're in a leadership field, right? The 
DDA's business administration, the EDD is an EDD in leadership. There needs to be in your problem statement some connection either to business if you're an EDA student or to leadership if you are an EDD student. You're graduating with a doctorate in business or a doctorate in leadership and your research should connect to whatever specific, uh, specific discipline you are graduating in. And a great place to put that is right in the problem statement. So let's look at some examples. Um, and I want you to think as we look through these examples, how do you think these fit the criteria of a good problem statement? Um, are they limited in scope? Is what they're bringing up a real problem? Um, are we focusing in on a, a particular audience or a particular demographic that might or, uh, benefit from resolution of the problem? Do they have all of those things? First example I have is this, I'll just go ahead and read through this. Um, it is not known how the use of the smartphone application affects the technology accessibility barrier, the language barrier, and parental involvement within a Title I elementary school. Parental involvement has been identified as one of the most important factors impacting children's learning and development. However, encouraging parents of high poverty, high minority students to participate in parenting activities continues to be a challenge. Okay. A couple things I'll point out in this one. Uh, one thing you should not do, and that this particular problem statement does do, is take a question and turn it into a problem. This person obviously has a question as to whether or not the use of a smartphone application will affect the technology accessibility barrier, language barrier, parental involvement at a Title I elementary school. That's really a question. It's not a problem. It's not a statement of a problem that we know exists. The second thing that's wrong is that there's no actual citation to support that there's a problem. And that's probably because there really isn't a problem here, right? The next two statements have to do with parental involvement and encouraging parents of high poverty, high minority students to participate in and participate in parenting activities really don't have anything to do with the problem statement. Now, that in some cases could be okay because remember, remember that I said in your problem statement, there's gonna be times when you include other literature to help highlight why the problem statement is really a problem. Why is it, you know, who is it impacting it? Would be benefit, uh, who would benefit from the resolution. In this case, though, neither of those two sentences really do that. They, they don't really put that forward as to why, you know, even if we were to state that this the lack of knowledge is a, a problem, why satisfying that lack of knowledge uh, would really do anything for parental involvement. So a lot of work would need to be done on this particular uh, problem statement for, to make it work. Next one. Food waste in the United States has increased 50% since 1974. The problem is that there is little public acknowledgement of this issue at the farm, grocery store, and restaurant levels. Also, food waste across the value chain translates to financial loss for farmers in the form of crops left on the field, grocers and retailers through unsold products, and restaurants through increased food costs. This one is better, okay? Food waste in the United States has increased 50%. Basically, that's kind of a general problem. So there's a general problem statement there. Um, she doesn't specifically point out that it's a general problem. Um, but what she fails to do, actually, is she fails to two things. One, she fails to specify a scope on the problem. So now we're still looking at this from across the entire nation, and it's just that's just way too huge. And the other thing that she does is she indicates citations for the first statement, food waste in the United States has increased 50%, right? She cited that, right? She's got one reference there. But the actual problem, she doesn't cite. So the problem is that there's little public knowledge of this issue at the farm, grocery store, and restaurant homes. How do we know that, right? Is that her opinion? Or does she find citations? Does she find literature that states that the problem really is a problem? Now, where this one is better is that she does state a problem. She doesn't just take a question and turn it into a problem. She does actually state a problem. But she needs to narrow the scope. She needs to cite her sources. And she needs to talk about who this really is a problem for. Why do we care if we're leaving a bunch of food in the field and a bunch of food on the shelves? Who, who cares? Well, and, and in her defense, she does do a little bit of that. A little bit of that. But she says also food waste across the which uh, value chain translates to financial loss, well, then people are going to care about financial loss. So if she followed that a little more detailed, she would have been able to sort of specify financial loss for who, um, in what region. Um, are we talking about you know, Seattle? Are we talking about Washington State? Are we talking about Western Washington? You know, And who's financial loss? So there just needs to be, this was on the right track, there just needs to be more uh, bits to it. Here's the next one. 
there are no studies that show how the implementation of real life strategies can affect financial literacy amongst Title I high school students, especially those with language barriers. Integrating changes in the curriculum at an early stage of education is essential. Implementation of resource and financial literacy is crucial and most important must be done in the early stages of our youth's education. Further application of strategies which focus on minority populations and socioeconomic factors to administer financial literacy skills and knowledge are essential. Okay. Above and beyond the fact that the last two references are not formatted correctly, um, this one has a lot of problems. Okay. And the one that I can see is there really isn't a problem here. I don't really see a problem. I mean, can you look at any part of this and say the problem is the closest thing she's got is that there are no studies that show how the implementation of real life strategies can affect financial literacy amongst Title I high school students. That's really not a problem. If there's a lack of knowledge, that's that that might be a problem for some, but it's not a problem that we're going to allow you to use in your dissertation because you can point to a lack of knowledge in anything and everything. And fulfilling that knowledge is it's not what we do in research. So other than that, she's made a bunch of statements about the importance of financial literacy, but she's not really given us a problem here. And the other thing I would uh, really, really strongly recommend, this is just good writing quality, things like in the, the first sentence of the second paragraph, integrating changes in the curriculum at an early stage of education is essential. I'm fairly certain that Mo probably did not say that it was essential. That is the writer's um, opinion, and it's, it is opinion. When you use a word like essential, that is a kind of a loaded word, and it's pretty packed, and your chair will probably knock it out and say, okay, who said, what was said, but what did Mo really say about this, and why, why is it essential? Um, what other word could you use there? And she does it again at the end. She says, uh, financial literacy skills and knowledge are essential. Really essential. I just don't know that that, that can really be supported. Next one. It is not known how emotional intelligence of faculty administration at, a, at institutions of higher education influences the adult learner's success. Okay. Many problems here. One, there's not nearly enough information. It's way too short. Um, we don't really even have context. Two, there's no problem here. This is a, a, another lack of knowledge um, sort of question that's been turned into a problem. Um, but it is not a problem. Um, it's not a true problem statement. We don't know if there's a problem between emotional intelligence and student success, if there's a documented problem of that. And if we could see that in the literature and it's supported by good research, then we might be able to pull something out of that. But right now, what we have here is it's not a problem. There's no citations. Um, there's no scope. There's no uh, demographic limitations there's there's nothing there's nothing here um and this is just flat out not going to work so moving on to the last one recent studies have shown a high correlation between employee advancement and the effective use of soft skills yet many technical college programs do not incorporate instruction in soft skills consistent with this it would appear that the instructional designers and technology programs at the community colleges in the puget sound region have not demonstrated a good understanding of what it takes to design programs that cover both technical and soft skills. Okay. This is the best one we have so far. Um, we do have a general problem statement. Um, you know, it's perfectly fine to say the general problem is write that out and say the specific problem is write that out. Um, it's perfectly fine to do that. None of these examples did that, but um, it doesn't mean that you can. We do have a clear problem statement. Um, the general problem statement and it's supported. We do have a fairly clear and fairly limited in scope um, and, and size uh, specific problem. It does need a citation though. Um, there needs to be some way that we've actually validated beyond the opinion of the researcher that there really is a problem here. So once that's done, um, then this is probably pretty good. Uh, it'd be interesting to see where this would go. Keep in mind, however, that good problem statements evolve. Even the use of a problem statement like this, which is not bad, could be better, will be better, is going to evolve over time. And so if I was this person's chair, I would be saying to her, go find me the citations that say that the Seattle, uh, the Puget Sound Region Community Colleges have an issue here. Uh, go find me where that's documented. Or even if it's, uh, you know, just some way of being able to, to determine that that is really an issue. Um, and over time, we would evolve that problem statement. We would improve it. Um, so when you, like I said earlier, when you come up with a problem statement, you're going to start with one that doubtlessly, doubt, undoubtedly needs revision. And, and 
you will either keep it or you'll throw it away a couple of other but if you're going to keep it, um, you will make revisions to it. Your chair will help you. Others will help you. And then you work through those revisions and you go through cycle after cycle until you finally get to a place where you're you're feeling like I've got a good problem solution and I, I know I can research this and I know I can build a research study around it. Problem statement is not enough. Um, you're going to have to, as I've talked to about this, and it's not enough just to say the problem is, you're going to have to come up with uh, you know, different parts of it um, and be able to provide the context um, so that I understand that if you tell me the problem is X, but you haven't given me uh, some of these other pieces, I'm not going to really know why it matters or why anybody cares. So some of the things that you're going to build into your problem statement or the text that your problem statement will be built into in your chapter one of your dissertations can be the field or scope where the problem exists. That should be stated. You know, I can use my example of small business failures uh, in the Seattle area for family-owned restaurants under 50 employees. That's fairly clear. I might want to talk about what the Seattle market is like. Seattle is the fifth largest growing economy or fifth, fifth, fifth fastest growing economy in the country. So it would be unusual to see so many business failures. So that would be a relevant fact that I can include to help set the context for the significance of the research. So background of the problem, you know, what is the business failure rate been like for the last 20 or 30 years in Seattle as opposed to what it's like today? And what are the relevant things that might need to be specified to help me understand sort of the context of this problem? If there are any deficiencies in the literature, it's fine to indicate that. It's fine to indicate that you know, there hasn't been a lot that's been of work that's been done on this. And since you're going to be asked to do your research on something that is unique, it's very likely that there will be deficiencies in the literature. So it's okay to state that, but just don't use that as your problem statement. Deficiencies in the literature is not a problem statement. You're going to want to indicate who's going to be impacted, um, who will the resolution of the problem help, who is currently impacted by the problem, again, setting that context. And then again, tie it back to a specific leadership or business issue. Clearly the example of business failure, failure that I've been using is related to business and it would be a good DEA potential research topic or problem statement. But if you're doing an EDA and you're talking about leadership, you wanna make sure that your problem is a problem that has some link back to leadership. And those links are not hard to establish. Both leadership and business are fairly broad topics. You can establish that relationship. Just make sure that it's a real relationship, that it's not a faux relationship. You sort of said, well, everybody's leaders will just throw this at the leadership. That's not going to help. It's not going to advance the leadership field. So when you recognize that it does need to have that back to either leadership or business, and that you do need to be doing something that's going to advance whatever field you're in, you'll see the importance of having that connection. Some challenges with problem statements. Things to avoid. I think I've gone through most of these. Number one, what you come up with is not a problem. It's in fact a question. And it's amazing how easy it is to take a question and turn it into a statement and call it a problem. Well, your chair is gonna find it, so don't do it. Um, what you've come up with is not substantiated in the literature. You gotta have that citation or the citations. You've gotta show that somebody has already done this research. Keep in mind that the research that you're doing and the work that you'll be doing in your dissertation, I've already said it's advancing the field, but in advancing the field, you're also building on the work of others. You're not only advancing your field, it's very likely that you'll come up with specific theorists or authors whose work has gone so far and what you are doing is actually gonna push that work just a little bit further, okay? So that substantiation of the literature um, is key because you not only wanna show that the problem is a real problem, but you wanna show that in fact, this is going to advance the field and here's how it's gonna do that. Um, another problem that I've seen often and your chair is going to flag this in a second, is the problem statement you come up with is mostly your own opinion. Um, I work in a school, uh, I'm a principal in a school, and I see this, uh, children are doing this, or children are doing that, and so well, that's my problem statement. Well, it's great that you saw that. Um, it's great that you, you, you can sort of validate that, but it's your opinion still. It's still your opinion. Even though you're seeing it, you're visualizing it, you're still putting your own stamp on it as you interpret the, the things that you observe and, and sort of incorporate them into your own cognitive structure. What we want is we want something that has actually been researched. We want something that has actually been specified. We want something that has actually you know, been published. You basically find something that is not your opinion. Um, and if, if, if in fact you're so convinced that what's going on in your school is a real problem, you're probably going to be able to find literature that shows that that's a real problem. So you're going to have to do that. 
I've already talked about picking a problem that is too broad in scope. You know, define your general problem. It can be broad in scope. That's fine. That sets the stage. But when you get to that specific problem, narrow it down. You will thank yourself and for doing it. The other problem that you have are problems that we see with problem statements is that sometimes it's just going to take too long to research. You know, I decided that I want to look at students um, in fourth grade for the next four years. Well, that's going to take four years. That's a longitudinal study. It's going to take four years. So you're going to have to be gathering data for four years. You only have seven years to get through your entire doctoral program. So you plan it out appropriately. Your chair will hopefully steer you away from things like that. And then last one, this goes back with two broad scope. Um, you come up with a problem statement that takes on the problem for the whole world. You know, your job in your dissertation is to get done. That's your number one job is to get done. So make sure that you take a problem or come up with a problem statement that will let you get done. Okay. So I'll finish with the analogy. Rather than thinking of your research as the whole forest, think of it as just a seed in the forest. It is small but it will grow to reach out to other parts of the forest in time. The same can be said of your research. It can be small, limited in scope, acting on a small sample of the population. But if it's well-constructed, it will grow and expand. It can be generalized or transferred to a much larger population. So don't try to grow a forest for now. Just worry about planting your seed. What I'm, what I'm talking about there is just keep that scope, that narrow scope, uh, that, limit, that limited sort of size of your study um, in mind when you're deciding what you want to do. And for a lot of doctoral students, that kind of flies in the face of what they want to do because they're doing a doctorate because they want to do research that's really going to have a big impact. Well, it's not going to have a big impact right away, but if you do construct a good study that is defendable, that is valid, and that actually produces results that can be either generalized or transferred, you will have an opportunity to impact. And at the end of your process, you're going to ask you to do a dissemination step. That's where you either go to a conference or you publish a journal article that shows what your research found. So this is the genesis of that. You will do your research. It may be very limited in scope, but it will grow and impact others as you roll out your findings. Great. That's the end of this presentation. Um, hopefully you find this information useful. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, welcome back uh, from uh, listening to this rather bit long uh, video. Once again, I want to really apologize for the hiccup this morning, and uh, we really we we hope that no such a thing will you know be happening in the near future. Uh, this morning we. We have just listened and watched uh, this video and it really concerns one of the key and very important parts in our study. And some of the ones say that if you have no statement of the problem and if you have no statement of the opportunity or something of that nature, then actually you have no study. And maybe a number of times we we have heard here in this very forum of ours, uh, our, our seniors making comments like a statement of the problem is weak. You know, uh, sometimes uh, we say what you're discussing does not even appear in your statement of the problem. There are two categories of people here this morning, especially with the students. We have those people who have jumped to this stage and they have moved ahead, they are done with the crafting the statement of the problem, and now they are on course of their study in trying to investigate and trying to address and see how to answer that problem. There are some of us who are still wondering uh, what is that problem that I'm trying to address. So that is what it is as of this morning. I just want to invite us uh, to share whether within the context of this video or even outside the context of this video. Uh, I want just to invite us to share what is your experience so far? What is, what is it? Uh, uh, do you have a problem anyway that you're investigating? Have you already put your crafted your problem and it's there and the, you think, yes, this is, this is the problem. Remember, 
you have just listened to the presenter trying to tell us the difference between the problem of the statement and our opinions. So I just want to invite us this morning uh, to share with us what is your progress so far? What are your challenges in as far as uh, coming up with a statement of the problem is concerned? We really have uh, very few minutes and uh, I just, I'm just throwing this out there to you. What is that? How far are you? What are you, uh, what's your experience so far with trying to come up and trying to draft a statement of the problem that can be investigated? Okay, so I, I now put my, my eyes on my chat and try to see. And again, I want to be very sure that I'm not actually speaking to myself. These are quite difficult hours of the day. You can be seeing Certainly. people locally, but that's it. Yes, please go on. Right, thank you, Joseph. And certainly we have to demonstrate uh, uh, these issues around us as we work on our studies and works. I just want to start uh, with appreciating the video for me about two things. One, that a problem statement is a problem when there is you can demonstrate evidence or with some evidence that it actually exists was put mentioning uh, citing existence or evidence of your issue that you have either from literature or any other source that uh, you have to pick on the second item that for me i picked is uh, scope is really necessary and key you cannot go ahead and try to to chew or take on the whole world in the name of uh, trying to respond to the issues or problems around the whole world. So context specific issues or scope are really a good guidance for us to look on as we, as we move uh, ahead. Now, one question that still remains from my, from my perspective, maybe our seniors at the end of this, uh, session could throw some light on is even in the video I was trying to keenly look for that particular difference or drawing the line in the in in the language of dependent variable and independent variable where does the problem statement reside is it informed by the independent variable or or in variables or the dependent variable or does it even matter in that sense? And, um, or a mix of both. So I would also wish to learn from other people around the same idea on that issue. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for that's what I can say for now. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, yes, that question is not answered and uh, I, 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 I think we need to find answers to that question today. Where is the problem itself? Where do we put it? Is it does it come around uh, the independent variables? Is it uh, within the dependent variable? And uh, I, I am seeing uh, we have a number of uh, uh, professors with us. We have our very own Professor Joseph Ntai, we have Professor James Kagari, um, and I think many others. And we, we have a number of doctors around here. I want uh, to, to suggest that before we, we close tonight, that we will have some sort of, you know, good response to that question uh, James, I mean, uh, uh, Bernard has brought forward. And I thought I would do kindly before I, we would move on and before we could forget, I would do kindly 
through this question uh, with the you know a lot of humbleness to our very own professor uh, Joseph Mutai to maybe give a very brief address to this question Bernard has raised. Yes, uh, as we as we uh, wait for Professor to respond, I have uh, a, a concern from Kiss. She's saying, "Is the problem statement of primary data the same as secondary data?" Uh, so those are the issues. Um, we have about five minutes. Uh, to, to you know to bring the student session to an end and uh, before probably as we wait for professor uh, joseph and tai to respond to this i would like to invite my brother emojong ronald from nero you have a burning issue please go go ahead and share with us thank you okay um thank you sometimes i'm um, reading other people's work statement of the problem um if i use uh, if I decide to craft out of the traditional way and say instead of using statement of the uh, I mean this um, um, statement or a problem statement, what if I say mm -hmm. statement of the opportunity and how do I craft now and if I choose to use that particular route? So does it would I write in the same way or do I write in a different way to show that instead of it being a problem, but there's an opportunity to research, how do I demonstrate it in the in in, in that different perspective? I said. Thank you, thank you, Ronald. So these are the issues. These are the issues, really. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a position that I, I am just with you, Ronald. I'm just with Bernard. We are at that point where these questions are, are, are you know, we need them answered. I, I really cannot provide the answer. But the good news is that we have our professors here, and they are very ready to to give us uh, that uh, much needed answer. But even before we go there, let me, they see uh, our sister, Caroline, uh, she says, I think, and I believe that the problem is supposed to be in the dependent variable and these other variables are trying to solve the problem, waiting to be guided. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I see quite a very interesting uh, issues here that people are really, you know, uh, struggling with and surrounding the issue of the problem. I have just three minutes, and I want really to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor Joseph Mutai to make some comments on these issues that students have raised. Uh, Professor, kindly, if you can. Uh, address some of these issues that the students are raising. So one is where does the problem of the statement reside? Is it within the dependent variables or it is in the dependent variable? And then if you are talking about the statement of the opportunity, how do we go about it? Do we write it in the same traditional way or there is a, a very, uh, maybe there is a better way of doing it? Uh, Professor, over to you kindly, uh, if possible, uh, throw some uh, uh, information on this. Okay, it looks like Prof has some technical issues around uh, his network or something, but uh, kindly, kindly, uh, with a lot of humility, may I ask Professor James, uh, Professor James, if you may uh, kindly come in and uh, try to speak about some of these things that the students are grappling with. Kindly. Thank you, Joseph. Maybe I could start with the the issue of opportunity because 
this is a, a positive approach. And so remember when you have the statement of opportunity, it is again derived from the background. So you have reviewed literature. And in the review of literature, you first have the content. And then from the content, you have the context. As from the context that you actually contextualize the topic. So in most cases, the content is using concepts that are very difficult to understand to anybody who is reading. So it is answering what the topic is about. And in the contextualization, there is a form of a case that tends to bring out what the content you have been talking about is, is. And it's that context that you actually get the meaning. So in that context, if you are looking at the post opportunity, that's when you have to know what is positive about what the context is bringing out. Where is, how is it manifested in the context so that you get the meaning? And remember, getting the meaning in the context doesn't mean you have understood. So you need to conceptualize because that's when you translate the meaning into something that can be shared. So again, remember in uh, our first slides where we're being told to always problematize the problem, but now here is a, an opportunity. So the scholarly works in the background should show that there is that positivity in what you are unpacking of your topic. And of course, should be clear how it manifests itself. So in, it's in that case, that example, in most cases that you see how the opportunity comes into the limelight and you pick out exactly what makes it positive and with a justification. And so that has to be helped with existing literature, which you had to review in the content. And you come up with that example case that brings out the meaning. And within that context, the opportunity is well manifested. And you tease it out. And when you're giving the statement of opportunity, remember, it is a continuation of the background. So you bring that positive aspect of what you think is positive about what you discussed in the background. And it's of course not easy until you have the real context. And from that context, you get the meaning and you actually understand because you remember, or you should know that in the context, it is a bit abstract. And so you've got to bring it out and demonstrate that it is going to be understood. And in most cases, that's when you come up with a conceptual framework. Now, again, if you go to the statement of the problem, I'm aware that uh, many people spend a lot of time trying to explain the independent variable and driving the problem from the independent variable. To me, my understanding is that we need to first understand what is independent variable is. Why do we have the independent variable? Because we are manipulating the independent variable to see what is happening in the dependent variable. Mm. And so the focus is on the dependent variable as you manipulate all these independent variable who are interested in the outputs, in the outcomes of the independent variables. And so why should we focus on the dependent variable? While manipulating the independent variables? Because we are interested in the results. 
the output. And so if we are interested in the, out, the mm -hmm. outputs, why? Because whereas you're manipulating the invariant variables, then we are trying to solve a problem, which is to me is manifested in the dependent variable. But don't forget that you are manipulating the independent variable. That's my take on that. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I think this clears um, uh, issues that uh, students are faced with. And we thank you very much for always uh, sparing some time and keep awake on Sunday like this. Give us knowledge and guide us. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you so much. Uh, I see quite a number of uh, issues is still here on the on the chat, but I just want to to, to say that uh, thank you for raising your issues. But our time now is a little bit. Uh, we have gone past where we supposed to stop, but the, the we we want to say thank you for your comments. This uh, Michael saying where is the starting point for the problem of the statement, Michael? That's where we will start from. Uh, next Sunday. Thank you very much. Uh, right now, <clears throat> I want to once again thank all our senior, our seniors, our professors and doctors who are on call. And uh, at this point now, I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Michael Poche, who is going to drive the bus for the next uh, remaining two hours. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Dr. Michael. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph, uh, for ably chairing the session and uh, uh, again helping us to look at the very interesting video. I must also thank everyone who has been able to make a contribution uh, during the first session. Again, this morning, I want to commend all of us who have been able to wake up or on, on this day uh, to interact with each other. I must appreciate uh, people who have been consistently logging in ever since the time we started. Uh, thank you so much for the resilience and consistency. I must also thank the people who have shared the morning sessions and even these sessions. Um, this morning, I want to begin by appreciating Professor Joseph Ntai for having founded this platform, which is really critical for advancement of scholarship, uh, which is also critical for making sure that they enlighten each other. They say iron sharpens iron. I know the, the students find this platform very interesting because they are really a lot of facets of knowledge we learn. Uh, the bigger the forum, the more better it is. But also I must acknowledge that the forum is also equally critical for the senior colleagues uh, in terms of helping us to understand where the dynamics are moving in terms of knowledge uh, and the challenges which the students are facing. And that's why I like especially the, the morning session. I want to say in a special way, I appreciate Professor James for consistently logging in and uh, supporting the students, uh, helping mentoring senior colleagues. Professor James, thank you so much. Uh, this morning, I also want to appreciate Dr. Goretti Chione. Dr. Goretti, thank you so much uh, for being there. Uh, for, for all of us as a community of scholars. So this morning, we are going to be able to continue from where we stopped, uh, whereby Uh, sorry, uh, 
Sorry, my network was being disturbed. Uh, last week, I was saying that we had a very interesting session whereby we had uh, a presentation from Bernard and the elicited a lot of interest. And the, I think uh, it brought new frontiers, which are very critical in, uh, in terms of energy. Uh, and a lot of discussions went on. So this morning, we are going to have another presentation. Um, by James Mubandizi. Uh, I also want to acknowledge, uh, but before we have that presentation, let me also acknowledge Dr. Ibrahim Senze. He has been consistent with us. So I think uh, just like we did last time, I would really request James to take us through his presentation in 40 or so minutes. And then all the students and the senior colleagues will be able to give feedback. So uh, James, you can be able to take us through your presentation and then we'll move forward. Thank you. So Good morning. You, you have 40 minutes, please. Eh? Okay. Good morning, professors, doctors, and fellow students. My name is James. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I want to request everyone, let us try to take charge of our mics. Eh? Uh, okay. Please. My name is James Banjizi. And this morning, I will be presenting to you my draft research proposal. And the topic is antecedents for modeling decarbonization in Uganda. We shall have an outline of 10 parts. We shall look at motivation of the study, statement of the problem, purpose of the study, objectives of the study, significance, justification, conceptual framework, theoretical review, empirical review, and methodology. So as part of the motivation of the study, climate change is one of the greatest challenges facing humanity in this century. If you go to South America, there is a problem of climate change. If you go to North America, there is a problem of climate change. You go to Europe, there is a problem of climate change. You go to Asia, there is a problem of climate change. You go to Australia, a problem of climate change. You come here to Africa, we are having a problem of climate change. So climate change is facing the entire continent today. And climate change is impacting our physical environment, it is impacting ecosystems, it is impacting human societies, it is impacting health and the economy of all those continents that I've talked about. And when you come here at home in Uganda, the Uganda Vision 2040 recognizes that climate change is affecting all sectors of Uganda's economy. Hence the need for mitigation strategies in all sectors to ensure the country is resilient to adverse impacts of climate change. And I want you to appreciate that climate change is caused by nothing other than emission of greenhouse gases. And when we talk of greenhouse gases, we, we mean carbon dioxide emissions, we mean methane, we mean nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride, we have six types of greenhouse gases. But of these six greenhouse gases that I've talked about, carbon dioxide is the most prevalent of all those gases. And it's one is creating the biggest problem. Because for it, when it goes into the atmosphere, it stays there for so long. It can be there for 50 years, 100 years, for, for so long to live in the atmosphere. And also the warming effect from carbon dioxide emissions 
will also remain for multiple centuries. That's why we are talking of a problem that is across the whole world because carbon dioxide will be in the atmosphere for so long and it will be covering all continents and at the same time. So this table that I'm presenting here, it is showing us the, the bigger picture of the global emissions by sector. And when you look at this table, you find that the energy sector is contributing the highest amount of carbon dioxide emissions globally, 73.2% and 5.2%. Then waste, which provides methane and nitrous oxide, it is 3.2%. Then agriculture, forestry, and land use, which produces carbon dioxide emissions, methane nitrous oxide is producing 18.4%. So as you can see from this table, that carbon dioxide is the most prevalent of all the six grams of this that we are talked about, and that's what almost our research will be focusing on. And the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, this is what you call the sustainable development goals. They emphasize that as we think of achieving sustainable development goals, this campaign must go hand in hand with tackling climate change. So the 2030 agenda encourages all nations of the earth that as they think of achieving sustainable development, then the agenda of climate change must go hand in hand with that development. Why are we talking about sustain, achieving sustainable development hand in hand with climate change? Because climate change has put achievement of SDGs at risk. Many countries are not achieving SDGs because of climate change. For example, if you look at raising temperatures, are affecting achievement of SDG 1, 2, 14, and 15, just raising temperatures. When you look at extreme weather and climate events, are affecting achievement of SDG 1, 3, 9, 11, and 6. And combined together, these rest combined together, we cannot achieve SDG 16 and SDG 10. So as you can see, generally, climate change is putting achievement of SDGs at risk globally. And that's why all nations must think of how we can tackle climate change as we promote sustainable development of nations. So different scholars have studied and described differently decarbonization. For example, some scholars described decarbonization as carbon neutrality. And when we talk of carbon neutrality, that is balancing carbon dioxide emissions with carbon dioxide removals. That what we emit into the atmosphere should be balanced by what we remove from the atmosphere. And that is where the problem is. Secondary, climate change mitigation. And when we talk of climate change mitigation, we mean that we should avoiding or reducing emissions of heat trappings greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that we should avoid or even reduce emissions of heat trappings greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's what we should be doing, that we should be avoiding or reducing emissions of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Then there is what we call climate neutrality. Climate neutrality means that human activities should result in no net effect on the climate system. Because as we talk of carbon dioxide emissions, we talk of industrialization, those are human activities and the other ones causing emissions in the atmosphere. But when we talk of climate neutrality, it means that human activities should result in no effect on the climate system. Then they also conceptualize decarbonization as low carbon development. And low carbon development means that a development approach which provides development without with lower emission trajectory that we should promote development but with lower emission tra trajectories. So that we, we can build industries, we can build factories, but those factories should not emit carbon dioxide emission and other gases in the atmosphere. Then they also consider the carbonation as low carbon transition. And with low carbon transition, it means changing from using high carbon energy to just using low carbon energy. That is what we call low carbon transition. And others consider the carbonation as Net zero greenhouse gases, net, net zero greenhouse gas emissions, which means balancing emissions of greenhouse gases with 
removals of those gases from the atmosphere. So from the six conceptualization, we can define now decarbonization as balancing emissions of carbon dioxide emissions with removals from the atmosphere or moving from high carbon energy to low carbon energy. All these are just definitions of decarbonization. Then also several studies have identified a diverse set of incidents for modeling and decarbonization. And as you can see, the incidents are categorized into four broad categories. One, we have social economic drivers, we have sector drivers, we have energy technology innovation drivers and political drivers, four broad categories of incidents. And when we talk of incidents, these are the factors that aid in modeling of decarbonization. And we have GDP, we have population growth rate, urbanization, human development index, and the index under social economic driver. Which means that the higher the GDP, if a country is having high GDP, then it means also emissions will be very high because it means you are having factories and you are producing, and therefore emissions will be very high. If the population is growing, then the direct correct also emissions will also grow. If, if towns are growing, means also emissions will grow. So these are factors that influence emissions of carbon dioxide emissions. Then we talk of sector drivers. And when we talk of sector drivers, Shalmina mentions four critical sectors that contribute towards high emissions, which means there is aviation, there is shipping, road transport, and industry. Those are the four critical sectors that contribute to emissions. But also the drivers include energy consumption, energy intensity, access to electricity, investment, air transport freight. So these are the factors that influence carbon dioxide emissions. And also modeling, if you are to reduce those emissions, they are the factors. So they, they influence emissions and they also influence reduction of emissions. Then we also have what you call energy technology innovation drivers, development of fewer technologies. If we have fewer technologies, those are the factors that can reduce emissions. That is what you call decarbonization. The description of automobiles, if we change it from using these cars that use petrol and the diesel, and we go to cars that use electricity, electric vehicles, that is a decarbonization. If we talk of penetration electric cargo trainers, assuming we in Uganda we have fewer trainers, but if we had trainers that, are, that can use electricity, that is one way of decarbonizing atmosphere. So when we talk of energy technology innovation drivers, these are factors that can reduce emissions. When we talk of carbon capture and storage in manufacturing, carbon capture and storage in electricity. So what we call carbon capture and technology, that is that as you emit carbon dioxide emissions, instead of the atmosphere, you capture it and convert it to other products. All these are incidents for modeling and decarbonization. Then the last category is called political drivers, access to improved sanitation, energy mix, investment in energy projects, government support, industrialization, environment targets, fuel price projections, foreign direct investments, all these are the factors that can influence either high emissions or they can also influence lower emissions. And that's what, what we call incidents for modeling and decarbonization. So they are in four broad categories. Then as we move further under motivation, nations have come together, put their efforts together so that they can fight the problem of climate change. And one of those efforts, it is through organizing meetings. And one of the special meetings that is organized is called COP. COP means Conference of Parties. Parties are the countries or nations. So when they come together, it is called a Conference of Parties. And we have had 26 meetings of, we have had 26 Conference of Parties since we, this, the, the fight against climate change started. And the, the meeting that took place in the, in, in France, which is called the COP21. It is called COP21 COP in Paris. The parties agreed on three fundamental decisions or fundamental agreements. One is to achieve a balance between emissions by sources and also removals by, by, of greenhouse gases. That's what was not. They should, uh, we should achieve 
So at what we emit in the atmosphere should be with what we remove from the atmosphere. That was the first, the first argument that the countries came together or agreed upon. Secondly, that we should limit warming to grow two degrees centigrade, or even push further to 1.5 degrees centigrade. It was also agreed in that meeting of COP21 in France. Then thirdly, that council should prepare and maintain successive national determined constitution. That is that country should come, should also run campaigns of fighting climate change. And those campaigns should be prepared, communicated, and, and uh, 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 communicated on, uh, in, in these different, in, in the subsequent meetings. However, as we move in the, in the, in the meeting that took place in the grass, that, that was last year in November, which we call, which we call COP26, the world is currently not on track to meet the, the target of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Actually, today, instead of moving towards 2 degrees centigrade and 1.5 degrees, we are heading for a catastrophic temperature rise in excess of 3 degrees centigrade. That's where we are standing. So instead of moving to one, 2 degrees or 1.5, the world is heading towards 3 degrees centigrade. That shows how the problem of climate change and global warming is on a global scale and even at the Ugandan scale. So why are we not heading towards two degrees centigrade? One, there are a number of reasons that are put here, but for example, number one, it is a lack of use of best available science and technology for effective climate action and policy making. So there is a lot of technology that has been researched by different scholars. That technology is not used by nations. Then, for example, there is adaptation finance. Of course, climate change requires finance because it is affecting the economy. Therefore, it requires money that needs to be invested in. And many countries are not investing a lot of money into climate change as required. When you look of, for example, collaboration, climate change is a global problem. It is not a problem of Uganda only, it's a global problem. Therefore, there should be collaboration among different nations, but mainly collaboration is not there at the global scale. So that's why many countries are grappling with the problem of climate change. So what is our statement of the problem? So from the systematic literature, what I was discussing with you about conservative decarbonization, when we are talking about antecedents, I did a systematic literature review to where all those IT, all those incidents and contribution came from. So now I was saying that from that literature review, which I'm calling Mubanjis at R2021, although it is not yet published. Notwithstanding the different views from different scholars about conservation and incidents of modeling the collaboration, most of the published papers fell short of providing a comprehensive assessment of the incidents for modeling of the collaboration. So that most of the papers fair short of providing a comprehensive assessment of incidents for modeling and decarbonization. Because scholars like Sanchez and Vilamar argue that incidents for modeling and decarbonization require a combination of social economic, energy technology, sector, and political drivers. So that if you are studying about incidents, they should be studied together. But many scholars, what they have done, they are doing it in what you call a piecemeal approach, whereby one scholar is studying about social economic drivers, another scholar is studying about energy technology, another scholar is studying about sector, another scholar is studying about political drivers, but very few scholars are studying them in a, a whole. Let me take you back to that table of incidents and explain to you what, I was, what I'm trying to tell you. For example, if you look at social political drivers, we find that the, we have a scholar like Sharmina. Sharmina, who talked about who wrote about the GDP as one of the incidents? Then she will also be she will also be appearing under sector drivers. So it means that she has talked about social economic drivers and also sector drivers. But if you come down, she will not be appearing anywhere. Which means she talked about sector drivers and and social economic drivers. That's what you call peace military. They are studied not as a whole. When you look at crack, for example, here, yeah, crack, who, who wrote about to human development index and the gene index, he will also be appearing here under access to electricity. But if you come down, then he will not be anywhere. So it means that some scholars are focusing on incidents, on social economic drivers, others are focusing, but you'll find that some scholars 
like Feng and Zhang, he only talks about is is under social economic drivers, but is not anywhere. Some scholars have written about social drivers only, others have written about energy technology drivers only, others have written about political. So that is what you call studying incidents in a piecemeal approach, whereby not one scholar tackling all the four incidents together. And that's where our study, that's what I'm trying to explain at the Clark studied the focused on social economic drivers and sector drivers. This one studied sector drivers. This one studied about energy economic drivers, but this study is ignored the synergy that can be done from setting these factors together in a single study. So uh, they, 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 they don't do them in a single study. And our study will focus on that so that we can study all the incidents, incidents of modern recovery in a single study and that's the technology gap that we are trying to, we have identified and that we are trying to, uh, to, to study and the approach. So more of so these studies investigating incidents from, especially also, in, also studies investigating incidents in Uganda are not are, are limited. That is when we come to, to Uganda and Refu. Therefore, this study will continue to, to literature by determining the most important incidents for modern recognition in Uganda. So the, our study will continue towards identifying incidents for modern recognition in Uganda, but also doing it in a, just combining them together in one study. What the purpose of the study? The purpose of the study is to determine the most important incidents for modern recognition in Uganda. And our study will be guided by seven objectives. The first objective is to identify the incidents for modern recognition in Uganda. Technically, this one is already done because we have already identified the incidents. But of course, when you're writing the final report, it will be as if you did it before. But the objective number one is already achieved because we have already identified them. Then, secondly, to estimate the relative importance of the incidents for modern recognition in Uganda. So, having identified the incidents, the second objective is to to estimate the relative importance of each of the incidents. There is what you call, there is a model there is, uh, that I'll be explaining as we move ahead that you, you can rank these incidents. And now if we got five incidents, four incidents, we got sector, sector economic drivers, we got sector drivers, we got energy technology drivers, and we also got political drivers. How are they ranked? Which one is the most pressing? So you can rank them. We say this one is number one, this one is number two, this one is number three, this one is number four. So that ranking is what I'm talking about, getting the hierarchy of the incidents. Then number three, we shall look at the relationship or the influence of social economic drivers on decarbonization. Because we have four incidents. So we shall look at the, the influence of social economic drivers on decarbonization. We also look at the, the effect of energy economic drivers on decarbonization. We shall look at the impact of sector drivers on decarbonization. Then we shall also look at the impact of the effect of political drivers on decarbonization. Then we shall have a combined effect of all the four drivers on how they influence the decarbonization. And these are the objectives that we are be having for our study. They just wanted to for this one, and everything in recent, in recent, in the summer. You what? Yeah. So, what is the significance of our study? As we said, the study will determine the most important incidents for modeling and decarbonization. And this study will adopt an analytical hierarchy process model and the autoregressive decision rag on the model to identify the incidents for modeling and decarbonization. That's what I was saying. To, to, to rank the incidents, we shall use what you call the analytical hierarchy process model and then to determine the long term relationship between the different incidents on decarbonization. We shall also use the autoregressive decision rag model. We are using this model, the, the ARD error, because it is more authentic in smaller samples and avoid this problem of endogeneity and helps estimate the coefficients in the long run. So, if you want to study the long run relationship of different variables, then ARD error is the one which is most appropriate. Then, HP is using, it is called a multiple criteria decision making approach. If you want to, if you are having various very many items and you want to choose which one is the best, then the best approach to use is AHP. Because as you find that you find that we, are, we have identified very many incidents, but we need to choose which one is most important, which one is less important, which one is which one is which one should we apply first. 
then if you want to achieve that for multiple criteria decision making, then AHP or an inquiry process is the most appropriate. And once we have done the ranking of the incidents, having identified the incidents, having ranked them, and also established their influence, their long run relationship on, on the combination, then decision makers in Uganda will be able to, be, to make energy policy using the study that we shall have conducted. And what is the description for this study? As we said, the, as we said, the problem of climate change is affecting all nations of the earth. And therefore, when we are discussing the carbonation of the atmosphere, it is crucial today than ever before. And I then think the incidents for modeling the carbonation can no longer be an option, but rather in a system because of the adverse effects of climate change, as we talked about them, affecting the economy, affecting the ecosystems, affecting human settlements. That's why it is very crucial that we should be discussing climate change, decarbonization, and incidents of modeling and decarbonization. Then also, if you go to the United Nations agenda, climate change is key. If you go to Africa agenda 2063, climate change is also key. If you go to East African community vision 2050, climate change is also key. If you go to Uganda vision 24, as I talked about when I was beginning, climate change is also key. If you go to the development plan for Uganda, climate change is also key. Even when you go to the manifesto of national resistance movement, which is the part that is governing us in Uganda today, climate change is also key. And if we to achieve sustainable development, then we must tackle the problems of climate change. That's why this study is very necessary. That's why the, the study is required today and it is required today. What is our conceptual framework? We have the independent variable and the dependent variable. The, de the independent variable are the incidents of decarbonization. And I believe at this stage, everybody understands the incidents of decarbonization because we have talked about them from the beginning. And they, as we said, they have been categorized into four broad, broad categories. We have social economic drivers, energy technology drivers, sector drivers, and political drivers. From the huge list of the social economic drivers that I showed you in the, in the introduction, we shall look at three variables, which is GDP, population growth rate, and population growth rate. And from the huge list of the energy technology innovation drivers, we shall look at industrial growth rate, manufacturing growth rate, and renewable electricity output rate. From the huge list of the sector drivers, we shall use renewable energy consumption rate, access to electricity, and energy intensity. And from the rest of the political drivers, we shall consider fuel exports rate, fuel imports rate, and foreign direct investment as our political drivers. And this will be the independent variable. Then the dependent variable is decarbonization. And also of the six gases that we had, six greenhouse gases, we shall also consider carbon dioxide emissions. Why? The independent variables are dependent on the available data because most incidents don't have data. But this one that I put here, we have data from World Bank explaining that trend from 1960 until today. Carbon dioxide emissions, of course, we said the carbon dioxide is the most prevalent gases. It is the most prevalent gas of all the emissions, and its data is also available from 1970 until today for Uganda. And that's why, why, why the, 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 these ones have all been, and our objectives, as we said, the first objective is to identify the incidents. Secondary is to, uh, the, the, they are ranking, that is on the independent variable. Then third, the objective three, four, five, six, and seven, it is the relation between each of these drivers on the carbonization and the last objective, the combined effect of the incidents on the carbonization then we can go to theoretical review. Our study will be anchored on the environmental Kuznets curve theory. So our study will be anchored on the environmental Kuznets curve theory. This theory was developed by a scholar called Simon Kuznets in 1955. And that's why even the theory is named against him in environmental Kuznets curve and the 
person who invented the theory, who anchored the theory, was called Simon Cosenets. However, this theory has also been elaborated by other scholars. And the one who did the great consolidation is called Grossman and Kruger. And this did, he, he did his works in 1991 and 1994. However, the other scholars also have, also have, have had an input on this theory, and they include Shafiq and the uh, Shafiq, then there is uh, Serden and Song, there is Panayu, Panayutu, then there is Serden, Koropa, and Grift. All these have done, have made improvements on the original theory drawn by Simon Kozinet. And this theory is found useful in this study because this theory explains the relationship between environmental degradation and the income. So the environmental Kozinet's scam theory describes the relationship between environmental degradation and per capita income, which is the same as low carbon development conservation because also low carbon development, which we talked about in the introduction, it is that as you promote economic growth, do not harm the environment. And also the the scalp theory, that's what talks about that as you promote GDP, think about environmental degradation. And that relationship is what we are studying in our study. And that's why the theory has been chosen to, 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 to anchor our work. And according to this theory, it is, uh, they said, it, it is similar to this graph, that during the initial stages, as you promote GDP, that as you promote GDP or per capita income, then the graph shows that there is also an increase in the environmental degradation shown by the increase in the graph that as you increase in GDP, then also environmental degradation increases. But after some time it reaches a turning point, then, then as GDP increases, then environmental degradation reduces. That is what proponents of, of, of this theory talk about. However, there are some critics this theory. One, there is what you call empirical evidence is mixed. That there is no guarantee that economic growth will see a decline in pollution. That's what we are talking about in the second part of the graph. That as, that as you promote GDP in the initial years, it will increase the environmental degradation. Then after some time, that the degradation will decrease as in, with increase in GDP. And they are saying this one cannot be proved. That is the critics of the theory. Then secondly, they say that pollution is not the only factor that contributes to GDP. That it, that, that okay, they say that, the, that GDP is a function of uh, that pollution, environmental degradation is a function of GDP. But the, the, the critics said this, that this is, GDP is not the only factor that, influ that is influencing environmental degradation, but there are other factors. For example, the incidents we are talking about, other factors influence environmental degradation apart from GDP. So that's why. Our study is coming with other factors that influence GDP, that influence environmental degradation apart from GDP. That's the criticism of the environmental coosinate scarf theory. However, this environmental coosinate scarf theory has attracted attention of very many scholars, and people have done research using this theory. For example, a study that was conducted in Zambia in 2021 by Cuthbert. And they're saying econometrics of environmental coolness curve in the face of climate change and sustainability in Zambia. So a study has really been done using environmental coolness curve and investigating climate change in our own country, in our, in our continent in, in, in Zambia. And that's why we're also using this very coolness curve theory to do a study in Uganda because it has been used everywhere and other scholars, but if and I've only got the but there are very many people who have used the environment schools in the scarf to study their work. Then what is the empirical review? The empirical review is hinged on the incidence of decarbonization. And from the empirical review, we shall be having hypotheses that will be tested. And we are having 13 hypotheses because from the, the type of incidence, we are having 12, 12, 12, we are having four drivers, I mean, four incidents, broad categories, but each, each category is having three 
23 sub incidents. So that's why when we come to hypothesis, we are having 20 questions that, in, that, that will be answered in our study. And the 13th one you know, that is merging all the four that is that is merging all the all the questions above that we have one broad question that will be that will be tested that there is no positive and significant influence on G, of gdp on the carbonation there is no positive and significant influence of population growth rate on the carbonation there is no positive and significant effect of industrial growth on the carbonation there is no positive and significant impact of new energy output rate on the carbonation. so these are the answers that will be tested in our study then we can go to methodology as we move towards reaching the end of our presentation. So under methodology, we shall be going looking at the philosophical paradigm orientation of our study. But to understand the, the, the philosophical paradigm of our study, we shall look at the ontology, or the ontological orientation, we shall look at the epistemological orientation of our study, then we shall look at the positivism, constructivism, and then that's when we shall be able to understand. But when we talk of ontology, the key question that we are asking is what is the reality out there? Ontology is about what is the reality out there? And to answer that question, there are three ontological briefs about reality. One, that there is a single reality. Second, that there are multiple realities. And third, that the reality is constantly negotiated, debated, or interpreted. That is how reality is interpreted by that. There is a single reality, there are multiple realities, and reality is constantly negotiated, debated, and interpreted. So for our study, we are seeing that there are multiple realities. For example, when we talked about conceptualization, it is conceptual differently by different scholars. There is no single conceptual recognition. It is concept, as we have seen, it is conceptual as, as low carbon transition, low carbon development, climate change mitigation, low carbon climate neutrality. So there is the, the amount of priorities about consumer decarbonization. When we come to incidents of modeling decarbonization, also there are very many incidents for modeling decarbonization as we have seen, sector drivers, <coughs> economic drivers, political drivers, energy economy. So we are saying there are multiple priorities. That is the ontological, very, uh, the ontological view of, of our study. Then we look at epistemology. And when we talk of epistemology, it is how can I know the reality? Having understood it, how can I know the reality? That's the question we, talk, we, we answer when we are talking about epistemology. And to know the reality, there are three briefs. The one that knowledge can be measured using reliable designs and tools. Second, that knowledge needs to be interpreted to discover the unring meaning. And the third brief that knowledge should be examined using whatever tools are suited to solve the problem. So for us, for our study, we are taking the view, the belief that knowledge needs to be interpreted to discover the underlying meaning. Because for example, for our study to arrive where we are, we did a systematic literature review. The systematic literature review was helping us to, to discover the underlying meaning in the word decarbonization and incidents. We are looking at an HP model. The HP model is supposed to help us also to discover the underlying meaning in the incidents we have already discovered. Then we are also going to look at the auto regressive decision lag. This, 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 this model is going to help us to, to know the long term motion between the different variables on the calculation. So, all these ones are help us to, 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 to discover the underlying meaning. So, the, the epistemological belief is that the knowledge needs to be interpreted to discover the underlying meaning. So, when you combine ontological belief and the epistemology, that's when you come to the research paradigm. And the research paradigm is interpreted in the three. We have three types of research paradigm, which is positivism, constructivism, and pragmatism. And under positivism, pragmatism, they have under positivism, they have that there is a singularity, and which you can measure in reliable designs. That is one one. That is paradigm. Or that is what you call positivism. Under constructivism, they have that there are multiple priorities, and knowledge needs to be interpreted to discover their underlying meaning. And under pragmatism. That the reality is constantly negotiated, debated, and interpreted, and also that knowledge should be examined using whatever tools are best suited to solve the problem. Therefore, for our study, we shall use constructivism. So, the purpose of our study is to examine the most important incidents for modeling the cooperation in Uganda. So, we shall use constructivism, which is that there are multiple realities, 
and knowledge needs to be interpreted to discover the underlying meaning. And I believe what we are trying to do to the we study to them the most important thing that is that we are trying to discover the underlying meaning in this whole study. That's why we are using constructivism as a philosophical paradigm orientation. Then what is our research design? The study will employ the descriptive research design. And what is the reason for this? Because under descriptive research design, the researcher does not usually begin with the hypothesis, but it is like a after collecting data. Under descriptive research design, the researcher does not begin by begin with hypothesis, but you begin by collecting data. And I believe that's what we have done. That by, by the time we arrived at the hypothesis, which I shared with you under empirical review, we had to do a lot of study. To, 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 go, to know the concept of decarbonization, to know the concept the how we incidents of modeling decarbonization. So then we get the concept of we get the theoretical review so that at the end of the day we can be able to arrive at the process. And when we are doing that, that's what we call the descriptive research design. Then second, there must be the mass correction of information requires careful section of units of study and careful. So that's what we have done at the, to arrive at the we have done a smart data review, and that is what we call descriptive research design. Then our search approach we shall use a mixed methods approach. That is both qualitative and quantitative. And we say the qualitative approach has been right on when we are conducting a systematic literature review to identify the incidents of decarbonization. Then we shall use quantitative approach when we begin doing the analytical hierarchy process to, 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 to know the rank of the different incidents we have collected and also to determine their, their long run relationship on, on the, their long run relationship on on the carbonation using the RD error model. That would be a quantitative approach. So we are going to use a mixed approach that is qualitative and quantitative. And the description of geographical area, the study will cover two sectors. That is the electricity and industry. Okay, we cover the industrial sector because as we saw from the first table, the industrial sector is contributing the highest amount of carbon dioxide emission, which is almost 78.4%. So that's where our study will be focused on on the industrial sector. And the data we shall use, I said we are going to use data from World Bank and shall study from 1975 until that is the data for the last 45 years because we have emissions, that data for emissions from 1960 until today, so we have that for the last of 25 years. And we shall use data from World Bank because it's already available and actually have already collected it. Then there will be some 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 variables we'll be having some missing data points and also we will also be estimated using the interpolation method. Then before we do data analysis, we shall do quality control tests. And they are what you call pre-estimated pre-estimation diagnostic tests and post-estimation diagnostic tests. And the and the under pre-estimation that we shall do, we shall take for any relationships and that we, we shall use a scatter plot. Testing for normality of the series, we shall use a histogram with a normal plot. We shall take for multicollinearity, and there we can use the effect variance inflation factor, and the reason for it is there. Testing for stationarity of the variables in the model, that is, we shall conduct the, the unit root, and to, to do to test for the unit root, we shall use the, the augmented Dikafura uh, uh, test because it handles bigger and more complex models, and it does not, and it. Uh, and it also takes care of serial correlation. Then for testing for co-integration, we shall use the auto regressive addition rag on the testing for co-integration. Then post-estimation test, we shall use the specification test, where we shall use the Ramsey regression equation specific error test or reset test. We shall do auto correlation, where we shall adopt the Darwin Watson statistic more test. And then we shall also do heterosystem, where we shall use the Bruch pagan test. Then we shall also use do what you call cumulative sum test for model stability. Because when we are using time series data, it assumes that the data, data is stable over a number of years, and it will also be tested. Even the model we shall use, we shall so that is the, we shall do for post-estimation diagnostic test and also post-estimation diagnostic test that we shall also conduct. Then as we move forward towards the end of our presentation, we can look at model specification. And to understand model specification, we shall look at each objective. So objective number one, identifying the incidence of modeling and calculation, that one 
was okay, I've already done it, but would it be achieved using a systematic literature review to, to understand the incidence of modeling and decarbonation? Then to estimate the relative importance of the incidence of modeling and decarbonation, there we shall use what you call the analytical hierarchy process model. And as I've told you, this analytical hierarchy model, it, it has been identified, it, it, we are going to use it because having identified the incidents from the literature review, we need to estimate their relative importance before determining their own relationship. And this method of uh, the AHP model was discovered by a scholar called Thomas Erosate in the 1970s, toward the end of the 1970s, and the, I think around 1979, 1980, that's when this model was discovered. And as I told you, it decomposes the problem into a hierarchy. So the, 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 the issues you want to study and group and rank, you compose them into a hierarchy, making comparison of those priorities very easy. And then having identified, put the, then that's when you can, the hierarchy that will be showing you as we move down. And this method has been used in the, in the health, safety, logistics, agriculture, forestry, construction. So it is, it is widely used. And even when you go on the internet, there are very many articles, more than 1,000 articles that have been published using the analytical hierarchy process model. But this model has, has some advantages. And one of the advantages that it is it, 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 it helps you in understanding and grouping very many complex issues together and understanding. But however, this model has challenges because it involves a lot of mathematics and, 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 and it is very complicated. It is hidden values which are also very hard to understand, especially if you are not coming from the background of mathematics. But the good news is that there is a software that can be used to help you achieve this, uh, uh, get the ranking very easily. So there is software for this work. That's why it has been made easy. But if you are to do it manual from Excel, it is slightly hard, and that's a limitation for it. So what are the processes for what, what that we shall follow when we are doing HP? First, it is what you call HP applications questionnaire. So first, you the incident that we have identified, you drop a simple questionnaire and you seek views from experts, they are ranking. And the questionnaire will be asking them to rank either from using five scale, that is equal in importance, moderate importance, strong importance, very strong importance, or extreme importance. So they give you a ranking. And when you are giving these questionnaires, there is no strict requirement for the minimum sample size of the people to be, in, to be, to, to be interviewed. Actually, James, the, James. Yes. Yes. We are running out of your time. Huh? I, I hope you are... just summarize. I'm, I'm summarizing. Okay. So this is a, so you run a questionnaire and you can get a minimum of five to 15 people to give you a, their views or you can, but some scholars have used 20, 30 or 30. But for our study, we shall only use like 35 people to give us their views. Then having gotten the questionnaire, then you, you construct the hierarchy and the hierarchy is coming from the incident that we discussed, the independent variable. And that's how we, you, okay, you, you, you twist the, 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 the incidents, the, the independent, the, the incidents and create like a hierarchy and so it looks like, so the questionnaire will be asking them about their views on how they rank these, these, these incidents. Then having within the, 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 answer, the, the, the ranking, that's when you can know these ones are grouping it higher, these ones are ranking it lower and these ones are ranking it um, less. But before you accept the ranking, then you, you, you do what you call, you calculate what you call the, you check what we call the constant ratio. And the constant ratio, that one is that what, I do, what you can do using, using a soft, the software that, that I was telling you about. But if the constant ratio is less than 10%, then you accept the, the ranking of the, the opinion of the experts. But if the constant ratio is higher than 10%, then you reject the opinions of the, of, of the, of, of the, of the experts. That's how you, the importance of, of this app, of, so that you know, well, the answer that we from, from the rich, how are they ranked by the public and experts of the industry? And that's what we shall do in our study. Then secondly, having gotten the views of the, the ranking, then we can do the, the, the last part of the, of the objective that is investigating the, the, the long-term pressure of the incidents on the capitalization. And that will be objective three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, as I've told you, to, to, to get the long-term relationship, 
then we shall use the autoregressive precision lag. And the model for that is, 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 is it looks like this, whereby we shall be looking at carbon dioxide emissions as our, as our independent variable, and we shall be modeling it against the independent variable, which are the incidents represented by this equation. Where y is the GDP, when you look at the PG, it will be professional growth, UR, it will be urban growth rate, IG will be the industrial growth. So all the incidents we talked about in the conceptual framework, all of them have been captured by this model. Then data analysis, we shall use data for the, the RDL, and then we shall also use the analytic hierarchy process software for the ranking of the incidents. And uh, all these tests will be performed using STATA and, and the software. And the uh, data for the incidents from World Bank for Uganda, I already have it, and I am very sure of the. Thank you very much for sending it to me. Okay, thank you so much, uh, James, for the elaborate presentation. And I want to invite everybody in the platform to appreciate James for being able to present his work. Uh, and of course, all of us have been following through right from the motivation up the end. Uh, but before we move into the, um, the question and answer, allow me to acknowledge very important people in the platform who are making very significant contribution uh, to us making sure that uh, we continue achieving our goals and objectives as a community of scholars. Uh, of course, I want to begin by appreciating Professor Joseph Ntai for uh, really coming up with the initiative and consistently giving us the opportunity uh, to share knowledge as scholars. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to appreciate uh, mentors. There are many who are not there today, but let me appreciate the ones who are there today. I want to appreciate uh, Professor James. Professor James, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Gideon, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jolie, thank you. And Dr. Goretti. I must thank you so much. And uh, you always logging to the platform helps us uh, in making sure that we support the, the PhD fraternity and also the, the scholars in different uh, capacity uh, to, to achieve their goals. I also want to appreciate the students from the different universities within Uganda who have consistently logged in. Uh, of course, without you, really there would be nothing much you could be congregating. I also want to appreciate the ones who have been able to present even previous weeks, and who consistently give their comments. Uh, I've had some private discussions with different people and really they have highlighted that um, uh, they are learning a lot. I also want to thank the students from the different universities in Africa, in East Africa, uh, the Sadak region, the Equus region, Asia and Europe. Thank you so much for logging in. Uh, this morning, we are privileged to have a presentation from James. And uh, I can, you can see that different presentations are diff taking us to different direction. So they are for advancing our understanding in different areas. Uh, I wanted to say something before we move forward. Uh, this general, actually, I happened to land on um, through my networks, uh, one, of, one professor from South Africa actually uh, was making a presentation and I also happened to be invited as one of the people. And the presentation was very interesting. And uh, in her topic, the topic was, today's research is tomorrow's innovation. And the professor demonstrated how she conducted, her and her student conducted a study in 2018 and the, by last year, they developed an app, which actually is helping them in supply chain. And they were able to get the, an award. 
by MIT and the different people across the world. Okay, now agencies are paying money for, the, for, for that application. And I think that professor will be coming to Uganda. So I want to, I want you to just keep tuned and maybe I will, I'll be able to get more information. But um, this morning, so this kind of studies, I believe can be able to advance more scholarship and also innovation. So I want to give opportunity to students to make comments, uh, maybe three, uh, then eventually I give senior colleagues, um, and then I can open up more completely to everyone. Uh, so I see there's a hand raised up by, you can go ahead and unmute and be able to make your comment. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tisa from Mo University, Kenya. Uh, James, uh, that presentation was really, okay, personally, I think it's like I was in class and I was being taught because now we are in the other side of the business, but I basically understood everything he has been explaining. Like I've just learned about the whole the whole uh, study. So I really want to appreciate James. That was a very good presentation. You were very clear. You've met somebody who didn't even didn't know anything to understand what you are you're presenting. That was really very, very wonderful. Maybe just a few things. I You kept on saying about the SCGs, one, two, three. I, I really didn't understand what they, they meant. I think maybe that's one part you didn't bring out. And then uh, you had a lot of uh, subconstruct in your, your construct, but I saw you picked a few of them. I, I don't know whether the, the ones you picked will be able to represent the, the, the entire, entire study. But again, another thing I was wondering, you're looking at uh, around 42 years of study Hey, and the four construct, hey, it's a very big study. I'm wondering how you're going to have to, to start all that and are you going to manage all that, that big study? Then you, are, you didn't bring out your population and how you were picking your sample or and who is that, who are those experts who are going to, to answer those questions? Where are you picking? Who, are, who is going to answer those questionnaires? Maybe those are the few things I didn't hear there, but thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, James. Yes, thank you, Doctor. And thank you, James Nemsek, for the good presentation. Uh, maybe my question or my comment or observation goes now to your chapter one and chapter three. Uh, when you observe, the way you presented your chapter three, you talked about the ontology and you looked at single, uh, multiple realities. You talked about epistemology, looking at subjective and you looked at paradigm construct, constructionism, meaning your interpretivism. Then I see you with the, the conceptual framework at the same time hypothesis uh, so what is what is your posi positionality uh, as far as the, the philosophy is concerned? Because what you have been talking about as if you, you are going to generate hypotheses other than verify hyp hypotheses which you have already stated. Uh, that, that is the, what I can comment. I, I mean, Maybe can you clarify as far as that is concerned? Uh, what is your pos positionality? Then two, I think already uh, the, uh, Lisa has talked about it. Maybe like what is your unit of analysis and your unit of inquiry? Who is going to give you data? It is important to understand here. Uh, it has not come out maybe clearly in the methodology. Uh, then lastly, I've uh, not heard you how, you talked about testing for, I mean, conducting diagnostic and parametric tests, but you have not talked about issues to do with the validity, reliability of your instruments. 
thank you, Dr. Okoche. Okay, thank you. These are very fundamental issues, James. I hope you are not taking note. I'm giving one more student. Then I come to senior colleagues. Uh, and then we come back to open it eventually. Uh, so Bernard. Thank you, Dr. Okoche. And I want to thank my brother James for the energy and putting this together so far where we, where we are going. James, I just have a few issues for you to observe and maybe look, look at after this session. Uh, number one, uh, very generally, I think uh, we got a little bit of lost between uh, decarbonization and climate change. And I observe, I think, for the presentation, you should possibly summarize the background and stay focused on decarbonization. We write our way hit on it, and then uh, we start moving forward. But two, um, on the objectives, if we can run there. James, num objective, uh, objective three, right up to six. Okay, those are specific and defining what? I don't think you need to, uh, to do number seven, unless you're testing hypothesis approaches are going to change because seven is a repeat of those up four unless you are going to interact with them. But in econometrics, you're not going to interact when the issues are standalone uh, in terms of what you are going to be testing. I mean, you can repeat the hypothesis test in number seven by just restating the coefficients of the other objectives up, but in a single line. So I think that's what I, I think you could, you should just, uh, you should consider maybe dropping the last one for this particular case. Now on the justification and significance, I think is the next slide. I also need to learn from seniors here, but I thought the significance here um, you are potentially maybe what the study is going to do rather than the approaches and the techniques you are going to use for achieving the objectives. And the, the justification I think is okay, okay, it's fine to me, but I think the focus was to be on to who is, uh, why this particular decarbonization issue matters by the evidence you have brought on the uh, issues, uh, the different institutions that you've uh, stated here. So I think that the significance maybe should do focus on what, why this study matters rather than the approaches you are going to use for this particular cause. Uh, last one on your, on your ARDL model. James, if we can run there from me. Okay, I'll just stick with the independent variable. I learned that this is going to be time series, but when you say CO2, I and subscript IT, you are stating a dimension which specifies a panel analysis, meaning you have individual units I to observe over time. So possibly it should be CO2 just T if it is going to be a time series and for only Uganda. But if you are doing this beyond Uganda and maybe other countries, then this one would hold. And so it should just work out through the same across the whole model. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Bernard. Uh, let me come to the senior colleagues. Uh, senior colleagues, can we make comments for James? Chair, should I go first? 
Yes, 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 bro. I thank you, Chair, and uh, I thank you, James Mubangizi, for the job done so far. And uh, this is uh, an interesting area. Uh, I want to emphasize a few things that uh, the students may have really talked about, uh, plus a few other things that they may not have brought out. Uh, let me begin with a topic. Uh, if you could take us to the topic. Uh, your topic is a little bit misleading and you have to think about it. Uh, because when you look at the topic and you listen to the presentation, uh, you, 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 you find some kind of variation, right? Because here you are talking about antecedents for modeling. So the emphasis is actually modeling. Uh, I get an impression that you want to look at antecedents for modeling decarbonization. So the, 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 the word modeling uh, makes a lot of noise in your topic. Um, uh, and it can easily be misunderstood uh, as somebody who is going to, uh, to, 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 to create models and uh, compare models and do some kind of simulations. And those are the models that will be used for decarbonization uh, in Uganda. So there is that perspective of it. Now, if you are looking at variables that are mapped onto decarbonization, you may have to rethink. You either do away with the, those first three words, or probably uh, you relate antecedents, because these antecedents for decarbonization, the way I see things, because you have your socioeconomic and so forth, but not necessarily for modeling. Uh, so the word modeling is likely to create confusion for you. Uh, later on, so think about that uh, topic, uh, those those words in your topic. Um, the 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 other issue is you said you've got the data right. Uh, your study, my well, your study is a bit different from uh, the ones that we are used to, uh, where we simply design our questionnaires and go out and collect data. You've got uh, secondary data uh, in form of time series. I've got time series data uh, and uh, I want to encourage you to study that data first and understand it very fast because your data must be mapped onto your proposal and vice versa. Right uh, Now in the background, if you recall, uh, you did talk about gases, right? And uh, the, 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 the gases we are talking about are carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, plus a number of other gases, right? And uh, uh, to you, these gases uh, result into that issue uh, of, of climate change, right? Um, and uh, I want to know, uh, when we look at the data that you have, or when we examine the data, do you have, for example, data for all these gases, right? Or you have data for one, and, and it wasn't very clear to me uh, what you actually, I um, mean, the data that you have, is whether it is for all those ones or just a few of them. Um, now, the... The other thing is that when you write, uh, there's a statement where you say that climate change uh, has put achievement of SDGs, I think it's, a, it's, it's a, um, under your motivation uh, uh, somewhere, climate change. You started with this, I, I quoted them, but I couldn't get the whole thing because you are very fast. Climate change has put achievement of SDGs at risk, at risk. Now, for me, I got um, uh, some issues here. I wondered whether you are studying climate change or you are actually studying decarbonization. And for me, I would rather that you actually rethink that sentence um, or that bullet uh, so that you bring out the issue of decarbonization 
uh, which certainly uh, somehow has an impact on climate change or whatever it is. So in other words, it's, the, it's actually for you to rethink the way you are, you are stating uh, those um, uh, statements. Now, uh, going to the drivers of um, uh, decarbonization, uh, if you, uh, I, I got some bit of challenge uh, trying to understand, right, uh, these things. And, and by the way, maybe before I go to the challenge or the challenges I faced, I, I want to know whether you've got data for all of these constructs, like when you got socioeconomic drivers in your data set, because you have the data set, uh, do you have GDP, do you have population growth rate, urbanization, human development index, gene index, right? When you got sector drivers, uh, do you have issues on aviation, road transport, industry, energy consumption, energy intensity, access to electricity, all of these things, and even the others which are on the other slide, whether you have data or the ones that you have uh, uh, selected and uh, used in your hypothesis. They are the ones whose data you actually have. Uh, so um, uh, you, 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 you need to rethink about that uh, before you finalize your objectives and the hypothesis because there's something that is not very clear there. Now, the other issue relates to your conceptualization. It's good that you've flashed that model there right now oh and now you have removed it i don't even know why okay when you look at your conceptualization look at decarbonization right decarbonization for you is seen in terms of carbon dioxide emissions right go to the table that is in the introduction slightly before this there's a table which you present as a conceptualization of decarbonization, that one. Now, when you look at your conceptualization, you are talking about carbon neut neutrality, right? And for you, you are talking about anthropogenic emissions balanced by anthropogenic removals. So there is that neutrality so that whatever is emitted is actually removed. And even when you go to uh, climate neutrality, for example, right? Uh, where you are looking at human activities which do not result into uh, a, a major effect on the climate change system, right? Even when you go down, when you look at the thinking or the mind that went into these words that you have there, which appear in literature, they are actually talking about um, uh, removal or low carbon emissions, whatever it is, or even transition that you have. So you are changing from high uh, to just using low carbon energy. Now, when you go to the, let's go, let's go back to the model. Your thinking changes a bit. Go to the conceptual model. You're, when you go to the conceptual model, you are looking at the carbon dioxide emissions, not the neutrality, right? And uh, even when you relate the, the the independent variables to the criterion variables, right? Uh, just look at, for example, socioeconomic drivers, right? When the population uh, growth increases, so we, we, we expect carbon emissions to increase, but that is not uh, decarbonization, because decarbonization is a neutrality now, because these must be removed, right? Uh, if urbanization growth rate also goes up, the same thing will happen, right? Uh, so carbon dioxide emissions will go up, uh, plus uh, all the other gases, the methane, right, the, uh, uh, the, the nitrous oxide, the hydrocarbons will also go up, right? But there you are using the word decarbonization. So the question I have here, uh, when you look at the conceptualization, right, and the, uh, and the kind of modeling that you are coming up with, I, I, I am not very sure the kind of data you have. The data, have you studied your data? Is it a data on decarbonization or it is data on carbon dioxide emissions? So you may have to think about that, right? Uh, because it might be the opposite of decarbonization, actually, uh, and not um, the other thing. So think about that one. Now, uh, let me see the other comment I have here. 
uh, of course check the relationship I've already talked about that whether it is positive or negative but it, with the way I see things it's actually very positive uh, an increment in one of these independent variables will lead to uh, an escalation of the emissions uh, and that's which is not necessarily the decarbonization um, yes um, let's move to the last st uh, the last uh, uh, okay, let's go to the statement of the problem. You have a slide there. Uh, statement of the problem. Yes, I, I, the last bullet, the last bullet in the statement of problem should actually more or less tell us what you are going to do. When you said this study, uh, what do you say? Therefore, this study will contribute to literature by determining the most important antecedents, right? Uh, it means the only thing you're going to do in this study, right, is actually to, well, because you know the antecedents, but you're going to rank them, one, two, three, and that's all. So meaning that the other things that you have in terms of relationships um, have been dismissed or, I mean, by, by you stating this in your statement of the problem, it means that that's what you're going to do and it's the most important thing. So you ignore the other aspects that you intend to do. So either you remove that bullet right and replace it with something that tells us exactly what you are going to do in your work um, or you rethink right let me see uh, the other one uh, when you say that uh, previous studies um, I think I don't know whether you you say it here or somewhere you talk about piecemeal approach right especially when you oscillate between those tables that you had in the background because you you oscillated and you are telling us you know this one did this we ignored this one here the other one did the other, the other things and uh, did not really consider this mine is going to to it's going it's going to be a comprehensive study uh, putting all these constructs in the same kind of thing so do you think your data has all of those constructs right and what does that mean uh, for your analysis and the data set you have because the more variables you have right the more cases you need uh, and you are very very silent about the cases you only talk about 46 years so if you have 46 or 45 or whatever it is even if they are 50 and uh, you have a study time series uh, study with so many constructs over 100 or 40 because I saw these things varying from time to time. In one table, you've got about 40. In another one, you've got about uh, 8 or 10 or 12, actually. Uh, so I don't know uh, whether you have combined, you have aggregated, you've done this and the other. But the data set, if you've got very few cases, you will have a problem. Uh, you'll have a problem uh, convincing us that um, uh, your results uh, can be generalized or they are generalizable. Um, let me see the other thing is about your objectives I had difficulties relating your objectives to the hypothesis uh, because uh, these must be mapped on be mapped onto the other uh, onto the hypothesis right so for example if you say identify the antecedents right you I expect one or two or three hypotheses addressing that if you go to the estimate the relative importance I expect some hypothesis so uh, for me for a start I would rather you have a table where you have the objectives and the corresponding hypothesis uh, or propositions uh, for that matter uh, I'll be a little bit comfortable later on you can separate if you want but I want to see how those things relate right uh, the other one has been uh, talked about too. Uh, whenever you deal with the data of uh, similar to the one that you intend to deal with there are issues of interactions and they will always be there uh, I think uh, even if you are not going to test uh, for those things we want a statement about how you're going to deal with those uh, issues uh, and uh, uh, all those interactions uh, may have uh, collinearity issues or challenges uh, that you may have to at least say something about uh, if you can now the other one uh, let me see relates to the conceptualization okay now what is your theoretical you talk about your methodology right um, 
uh, what is your theoretical anchor for the mo for modeling? Uh, is it the Kuznet or the Kuznet now anchors the entire study, uh, but not for modeling? Uh, for me, it wasn't very clear uh, whether uh, this one uh, uh, anchors the study and the modeling, or probably it's only for the other one. But for modeling, you've got another uh, theoretical perspective uh, to it. Um, now, the other aspect is, um, uh, let me see, uh, methodology, right. For me, when I looked at the philosophical, if you take us to the philosophical, uh, uh, that one, for me, I thought that as we were reading, you attempted to summarize notes. So these are your notes, not necessarily what you are going to do. Because even the way you're explaining, it's as if you are giving a lecture on what ontology is and not telling us how you are, how your study translates into these things here. Uh, so although you have uh, some columns there with the beliefs and the reason, me, I don't understand how this relates to your work. Right. Uh, although I have general knowledge or understanding about these philosophical things. Uh, but um, I don't understand how this relates to your work, um, uh, to be honest with you. So I, I want to see the philosophical uh, perspective that you are taking and why you think uh, that will address your study. Uh, to me, that is very interesting. And uh, besides, you, somewhere you say you are going to take a mixed, I don't even know the slide where you wrote those things, uh, mixed. You talked about mixed. Yours will be mixed. But when I look at uh, the objectives, the hypothesis, and the data you have, which is time series data for 45 years, me, I don't see any qualitative there. Right. Maybe your understanding of qualitative is totally different from mine, uh, which is also possible, by the way. All right. Uh, so uh, I, have an, I have an issue with that. Uh, but I don't know why you don't, uh, uh, I don't know why your modeling comes in a little bit late. And uh, um, anyway, I think for the time being, uh, I should stop there. Uh, Chair, I submit. Another person can come in. Okay. Thank you so much for, for those wonderful comments. And I think, James, you see, uh, from the comments Prof has raised there, eh? and even some of the previous um, your colleagues, you need to, to take put attention to that. Very, very critical. Uh, other senior colleagues, before we bring back James to maybe respond a few issues, because there are some issues really. We need to hear from him. Senior colleagues, please go mm. Yes. Mm. Mr. Koche, James Kagari. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, my name is James. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, my concerns, most of them have been raised because they were generic, but as a result of these previous commentators discussions and what they raised, it brought out a concern for me, which is a bit paradoxical, that if you look at, for instance, when they look at the topic and look at the purpose of the study, in most cases there is a relationship. In fact, the purpose of the study is always the topic. So if you find they are not in line, then there is a problem. Then the statement of the problem, if you look at what you are problematizing from the background up to the modeling, the focus is modeling of the antecedents. Uh, and so it's like your problem is about modeling, whether there is lack of a framework to model antecedents, against the uh, carbon uh, decarbonization. And so the problem is not necessarily addressing decarbonization. Another issue I get from the commentators is that you're actually not addressing decarbonization uh, or decarbonization because 
the solution is already there for it. You're already giving solutions. So I, and I wonder what's the problem? So I think the statement of the problem really should come out very, very well as they have already raised. Uh, the rest have been raised, but my issue here is uh, when you look through the background, all through to the model, the focus is about modeling, modeling of intercedents. So is that the problem? And of course, there is a mix up between decarbonization and climate change. What is the focus? And that has been raised. Uh, I submit, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, bro. Okay, uh, can I add something that I had actually forgotten, uh, which had been yes, raised yes. by, uh, by Bennett? Again, he has to look at the significance of the study uh because i think he has a, a misunderstanding of the significance uh and he needs to know that uh, with the significance we are looking at uh, really a written statement that explains why your research is needed right so in other words he must justify uh the importance uh, of research and um, uh, the impact it has in the research field so in other words, uh, it must move into that direction of the contribution to new knowledge and, and, and how people will benefit from it. Um, so what he wrote there is uh, more or less methodology. He should transfer that to the methodology section. That's all. Okay, thank you. I think James, those are very critical comments which could help you to improve on your work. Uh, let me add something on a statement. Yeah? Okay, to be honest, their models are there. But what's wrong with those models? Uh, which you can be maybe able to look at it, maybe what the strength of the approach you are taking based on the time series. And maybe, maybe looking at uh, the context of um, which you are taking the holistic, though you have tried to say it, but uh, I think you need to map up the different models very carefully and uh, try to point it out to the, 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 the critical DV. And uh, I think uh, if you address it in line with what Professor Joseph Ntaya said, being able to reflect carefully because most of the IVs you are saying actually, they, they increase carbon emissions, not uh, reduce. Though some are neutral, but you need to reflect carefully because it can bring a lot of confusion. I think the other issue is on the objectives. If you look at the objectives, they are like process objectives. What, you, what are you going to do? Uh, the first one identify the antecedents, and so already Amiti already identified. So, so I think you you could uh, make the objectives based on the the concepts or the variables which you have broken in your conceptualization, uh, such that the, the the model which eventually come up with uh, captures all of them. Uh, but maybe uh, I could allow you to respond to a few of the comments. Then again, I will take a, a next set of comments and questions because I really believe that um, uh, the, the comments which have been raised could really uh, help you. So I want to get your comments. Yeah, there are some questions really, which you, I think you need to, to answer. Decarbonization, the philosophical orientation, uh, the problem issue, problem statement, yeah, and then the modeling issues, yes. Please, James. Thank, thank you, doctor, and the professors and my fellow students for the questions and comments. I'm just here seriously noting all of them, and uh, especially comments from Professor Ntai. I will get some time and visit his office, and we shall uh, discuss them comprehensively. But for the other comments, I'm just recording them and uh, are you able to answer all of them when I've, I'm just recording so that I can ask all of them when, when I'm editing the work. But as of now, I'm just recording all comments and I thank you for the comments and I'm just recording them and ensuring that they are all recorded. Thank you very much. 
Okay, James, eh? James, eh? you unmute your mic, please. I was thinking, eh, there are some questions which are very critical because those questions are not just the, they are, I think somebody would want to guide you further. In terms of ontology, what is your, your philosophical orientation? Is it positivism? Is it interpretivism? In terms of, you know, because James, James challenged you that you are again saying they are, you are, you are going to, to use interpretivism, constructivism. And yet, already you have a hypothesis. Even Professor Joseph, that even if you are going to, I don't think there's anything different again you'll be able to tell you because they want to really understand. And also, given the fact that you have demonstrated you understand the different philosophies which are there, do you think the choice you have made is the correct one? Yes. Okay, what, what, what I'm presenting here is coming from the document I've prepared, but what from the document I've prepared, I, am, I was saying that I will use constructivism as the philosophical paradigm for the study. And it is based on the reason that the, the conceptualization and accidents of modeling and decarbonization, systematically that you have conducted, and the models I will use, all of them are after that they are multiple realities and knowledge can be interpreted to discover the unlink. So that's why I'm using the constructivism of philosophical paradigm. That's what I am about. Unless I can be guided on how I can change either from constructivism to pragmatism or post, but my study was uh, written in constructivism. Okay, uh, my belief is that um, even when you look at this slide, you are, we are looking all of us, based on the phenomenon you are talking about, you can clearly see that this is a, a positivistic study because the data is there, uh, there is nothing, it's just a reality which you are going to, there are no, there are no new realities you are going to, to really engage in. You know. But uh, I really felt that, and I think the, 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 the issue which Professor Joseph raised is very critical for all the students and yourself. Eh? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not about transferring what is in the document to slides. It's about understanding it properly before you put whatever you understand in the book, then eventually. Because really, like here, you, you have put all these things there. And I think, but thank you so much. Uh, what about the issue of carbonization and decarbonization? What do you think about that? First, let me talk about um, the, the, the theory because Professor Antai also talked about whether the, the theory yeah, more, the, the theory is, of, of course, the, 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 the study is anchored on the environmental coziness curve theory. But then this theory, the, the environmental coziness curve theory, it also has an underlying model. And that model is what I am transferring down when I was generating this, the, the model for, for, for the autodegressive lag. It is also based on the environmental coziness curve model. That's why you find that we have GDP, then we have GDP squared, then we have GDP cubed. Then that's when you bring in other variables like population growth, urbanization rate. Then that's why you bring industrial growth. So, so the, 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 the story, the, the environmental coziness curve theory is both a theory and can also be used as a model. So it is one theory, it, it is working as a theoretical framework, and then it is also becoming a, a benchmark when I was creating this model for, for studying the long-term long relationship. And Professor asked that question also about the relationship between the, the model and the theory. And the, 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 the environment causing the scout theory, it will be working as a theory on which the study is anchored and to also be creating a background for creating a model on which to model the, 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 the whole work. Then, uh, Doctor, you said which other, which other question that you are talking asking? The last one you're asking me to talk about. The issue of carbonization versus decarbonization. What, what is the focus? We are focusing on decarbonization. Okay, okay, first talked about uh, 
the data we are having, uh, the data I am having, it is all these incidents we are having here, starting from socioeconomic drivers, energy technology, sector drivers, and political drivers, each of these variables which is here, I have the data for it. Then yeah. also, then okay, the data for- Okay, James, okay, James. Mm -hmm. I think from what Professor was saying, like, let us talk about socioeconomic drivers. Do they drive decarbonization or they drive carbonization? GDP or population growth. When the population increases, does it reduce carbonization or increase? Of course, when one population increases, of course, when you are talking about these this social economic drivers, it is a plus negative. That when GDP increases, then carbon, carbon dioxide emissions increase. But of course, it is so, so now. So now, excuse me. Uh, yes. So you, that's what the Professor was saying. Because if you talk about decarbonization, mm -hmm. if you are talking about a driver, a driver should push it. Yeah? So I think you need to contextualize. I think you need to reflect further on that. Eh? Uh, I think that's. Uh, I don't want to reduce this discussion between two of us. Can we invite again other colleague, other people to raise more comments? But I think you need to reflect on that carefully. Uh -huh. I'll just take a little bit to think about it. Yes, okay. okay. Yes, uh, I want to invite most senior colleagues and uh, everyone to. Uh, but but the chair, chair, possibly for him to think through. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sure from uh, during his systematic review uh, of literature, he must have found um, a number of models for decarbonization. Um, uh, James, are you listening? Yes, I'm listening, Professor. Can you articulate, just list about five modeling approaches for decarbonization? We have RIP. Long range. We have RIP model. We have like the image model. We have um, Timus model. We have... Um, Great. Uh, so in other words, um, you've got a number including optimization uh, models. Uh, then there are many, many, many. Now when you look at your topic, uh, just uh, just flash it. Uh, antecedents. Is that the direction you are taking or you, this, this is uh, the, the direction you are taking now is totally different? Because when I look at the topic, I expect you to discuss those things even in the introduction. And then you tell us the path you are taking and why you are leaving the other models. Uh, but uh, what you are doing is to pick variables. Uh, do you think that, uh, don't you think that this topic somehow is confusing given the content uh, and uh, what, what, what the topic depict, depicts? I have taken note of it, and the, uh, of course, when I we, we shall, in our discussion, in our subsequent discussion, we shall see how we can either, 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 either remove this word modeling and what I mean with accidents for decarbonization in Uganda, we shall get of, of, but maybe this word may be, we shall still think about this word modeling and in our subsequent discussions and with it. But the direction I'm taking is, I'm taking the direction of accidents as the whole, the whole discussion was flowing from the beginning until the end, we are talking to take the direction of accidents. Okay, James, James, that is, taken, that, is uh, that is understood now, uh, yes. so you have to rethink. Now, the other issue that you have ignored a little bit, when you look at the data that you have, eh, the, mm -hmm. the, the last column or somewhere there within your data set, uh, is mm -hmm. it data on decarbonization or it is data on carbon dioxide emissions? The, the data I am having it is for carbon dioxide emissions for Uganda from 1970 until today, just how emissions have been increasing and decreasing in Uganda, that's the data I am having. Great, great. And the emissions have been increasing. In, yes, increasing and decreasing. Over the years, because of, because of urbanization and because mm. of uh, uh, yeah, GDP. We have talked about, yes. yes. And population growth rate. Now, <laughs> your decarbonization issue is about neutrality. Whatever goes up must be removed. Not so? Mm. So yes. do, do, do you have um, uh, a construct, sorry, do you have a model that you are going to use to get the, I mean, decarbonization out of the, carb uh, the carbon 
out of the increased carbon emissions. So, so that at the end of the day we talk about neutrality, carbon dioxide neutrality or methane neutrality. And for, for, for I was thinking, at uh, looking at the carbonization in terms of low carbon development, whereby development, we talk of the growth without hurting the environment. That's where the research is. Take note, not this direct air caps that we are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere directly, but we are looking at the, the development approach whereby as we as we increase GDP, as we increase urbanization, as we increase these are incidents, but we don't also create emissions into the atmosphere. So the direction of the research is about low carbon development. That's why we are rating GDP and also carbon dioxide emissions, not this direct air capture from the atmosphere, like the the, 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 the raw interpretation of the carbonization. But that's, I think that the direction of the research and the proposal is taking the low carbon development. So you are taking number four as uh, that is your route. Yes, so you, yes. But you may have to think harder. Mm -hmm. uh, as you do that, you need to think harder than that. Yes. Cheer, that's all. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, but uh, James, you see the, the kind of study you are doing eh? mm -hmm. is a bit unique. Eh? It's a bit unique. Uh, and it brings in, from your topic, it brings in the aspect of modeling, it brings the aspects of antecedents, it brings aspects of the carbonization or carbonization. And of course, those are issues which are critical. And uh, I think what is very important, especially when you are dealing with models, and uh, already there are existing models, you must you find that your background should be mostly trying to uh, demonstrate understanding of those models, if the modeling is the orientation you are taking. Uh, so, and then maybe now you'll be pointing out in this model, these are the antecedents which are there, and maybe you problematize what is the weakness of that. Did this model like that? And then eventually now when you come to building a problem statement, you, the problem statement now will come out arising from the, these existing models with so many weaknesses. I now want to come up with something very holistic. And then now when you come to the, to the objectives also, again, you see it not like the normal study you do whereby you are just simply casually identifying or whatever. So even like nowadays, an, an objective you have their impact. And most times studies of this nature, whenever people are talking about the impact, somebody physically is measuring those impacts. They will, they're, they're, they're measuring. So, so you find that like this, that, that objective. So what I want basically for you to, to do, because I know you have to be careful about it, because I know through the presentations you attend or the lectures, this study must be oriented to properly uh, deal with aspects. I like the way you explain the aspect of the, the, the model you are using and identifying the weaknesses. If you can bring it right from the back, because now that should be the orientation, uh, such that by the time you go into uh, the methodology and, um, and the approaches there, you find that already the context is very, very clear. By the time you come to the problem, then now, like you see, there is that objective, the impact of sector driven drivers on carbonization in Uganda. Other studies which have done this, they have basically really looked at all those sector things and the extent which it does to carbonization. Has it reduced carbon, carbon emissions because it's measurable, you know? So I think you will have to see how to position your study. That's what basically I see from even the comments and also my personally. You, are, you will have to be careful and position your study very well, but it's a good study. Uh, colleagues and the, uh, members in the platform, uh, maybe we can support again, James, by giving a comment so there are issues of clarity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Yeah. And I also thank James for the very good presentation that he has made. Uh, just like Professor has just been commenting, I would like him actually, when he looks at his conceptual framework, all those points uh, which are on the dependent variables actually point to one thing, that they increase carbonization. 
unless he explains the contrary, that actually urbanization, for example, leads to reduction in the carbonization, which is actually not correct. It would be a little bit difficult for him to explain further. Uh, also, uh, he needs to explain to us how do these points actually lead to decarbonization, which, which I see that more of them actually are tending towards carbonization, increase in carbon emissions. Something which actually must rethink and see how, how to work around it. Otherwise, I, I really want to thank him for the confidence and um, also his research, how he got all the information that he needs to put together. It, it's really a very interesting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Any other comment? Dr. Gideon? Dr. Ibrahim? Uh, hello, Chair. Yes. yes, please. Yes, Doctor. I would like to, to thank the president. I would like to thank the presenter, but uh, I see most of the comments are denoted, they have been elaborated. And I think maybe as part of guidance, uh, the presenter should pay attention to those major comments. There are some major issues in the work uh, and those in my inner one, but the major should really come out very well as is addressing them, I submit chair. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So James, those major issues. Uh, yes, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, most of the comments have been raised by the senior colleagues, but uh, that said, I want to thank James for the good uh, presentation, albeit, uh, a few uh, issues that uh, have been raised. Now, the first issue I want to, to raise is uh, on the issue of hygiene. These slides are so congested, yet when you look at uh, and observe the way he's presenting, he seems to exhibit a master of his work. Therefore, uh, moving forward, you will need to read uh, work on the issue of uh, hygiene and only put talking points on the slides just as it does much of the talking. Uh, the second issue I want to raise is on um, the problem statement. I know Professor Antai has uh, uh, given him some comments on the problem statement, but uh, what appears more in the problem statement is the theoretical gap he needs to move beyond that and equally include the practical uh, gap, the practical deficiencies in relation to decarbonization. I think that would uh, improve uh, his work uh, much better. Um, I see when you look at his conceptual framework, I note two uh, issues. One, if the conceptual framework does not indicate the source uh, of the items or the measures that is put in these uh, variables. You will need to, to, to work on that. And then two, it looks so much a simplistic model, a simplistic linear model. It's not complex to really match the level of PhD requirement. And I do not really see how we intend to handle uh, issues of uh, perhaps moderation and whether or not there are no control factors that would really uh, be brought into the equation while uh, modeling. So I think we may equally need to, to, to look at that uh, moving forward. Uh, finally, is on the issue of objectives, specifically objective four and objective uh, six. He tends to use the word effect, 
which gives an impression that this is really likely to be a longitudinal kind of uh, study. So you may need also to look at that and he uses the word influence, uh, continuously needs objectives, which really does not bring more clarity. So objectives are not really clearly stated as they should be. Uh, save for those comments and uh, what other members have raised, I find that really Kenneth is in the right direction if we can work on those two issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I don't know whether there are any more comments, but I think we have really uh, extensively discussed most of the issues. And I must thank everyone for, uh, especially Professor Joseph Ntai for uh, really uh, taking on time with the, with, the, with the candidate and all the other senior colleagues and the students, really. I think this is very, very good. But also I wanted to say one or two things uh, to the students. Most times when you spend time doing, uh, when you spend time on your work and try to put an effort, you find that um, you get very good comments which will help you to, to improve on your work. Uh, yeah, so I want to encourage all of you, uh, meet your supervisors, engage your supervisors, engage your colleagues, so that you have something to present and then uh, your colleagues and the senior colleagues support you in the process of making sure that you have something substantial, and then you finish this journey. Uh, I think uh, I would like to us to come to the end of this session. As, I, as we come to the end of this session, I want to invite Dr. Goretti uh, to make closing remarks and then also close with a word of prayer. Dr. Goretti. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Okoche, and thank you uh, all the members that have made comments to James uh, to improve on his work. Uh, actually, when you look at the conceptualization, that's where the problem starts from. Uh, I looked at this conceptual framework uh, following Professor Antai's uh, comments. And I see that if everything is not aligned from the conceptualization point, then uh, th there's a, a challenge. Uh, I, so James, I think that you need to, to pay attention to this. Uh, I was trying to, uh, I actually went into trying to check uh, on, on those measures. Uh, searched on those measures to see how they relate to decarbonization. And I was, I was not getting what you are saying, especially when you're looking at the uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, relationship between all those IVs, how they relate to carbon dioxide emissions. And you're talking about decarbonization, removing uh, carbon dioxide from the environment. So uh, you need to, to revisit your conceptualization and align it properly to the focus of your, your study. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, it is good to always be there in the battlefield and uh, take on all those comments and uh, improve your work so that it becomes better. Uh, conceptualization is very key. Uh, otherwise, I thank all of you that have been on this this morning, there, there has been a lot to learn uh, from the, the presentation itself and the comments that came up. Because sometimes we believe in what we've written without a third eye to see what we have written, to see whether it is right or wrong. So I thank all of you. Uh, that said, I thank God for this day. I thank uh, for the knowledge that have, has been shared. And I thank God for the gift uh, of the, the friends that have been on this call to share what they know and uh, to help each other. And we pray that we have a blessed Sunday and uh, we'll meet again next week.
I pray all this in the name, in the God's name. Amen. Nice weekend.